I give a little build up. Okay. Welcome everyone to the Center for Marxist Education for what is this the fourth event in the sixties? I think it's the fifth. Fifth. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Fifth event in the CC's Cafe. Other events are online. Uh, the videos for them. And this is the one this next Saturday. Actually, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I was. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're wrong. Sorry. Uh, Jeff Perry, who is uh, a working class activist and scholar, who's done a lot of work with Hubert Harrison and Ted Allen, who I'll let him explain it all. Um, he's going to speak to us today. And next Saturday, we have Ron Jacobs, uh, counterpunch contributor, author of a book on the Weathermen and on anti-imperialism in the 70s, I believe, will be coming to speak here. So what, 2 o'clock? Yep. Okay. Yeah, so I'll give it over to Jeff. Thanks, Doug. Thanks, Joe. Thanks to the Center for Marxist Education. Um, I'm going to speak today primarily on Theodore W. Allen, who lived from 1919 to 2005. Uh, how this ties into the 60s is Allen was actually in his 40s a member of SDS in the 1960s and uh, very influential in SDS and the New Left when he developed uh, some pioneering analysis of white skin privilege. But before that, for those not familiar with him, Alan, from right out of high school, went into the Communist Party. He's a coal mine. We'll, we'll get into some of his background. And I'll also be mentioning Hubert Harrison, who lives from 1818, actually lives to 1927. This is the first volume of a two-volume biography I'm doing on him. We have the books here. First multi-volume of an Afro-Caribbean, only the fifth of an uh, African-American, a total giant. He was the leading black activist in the Socialist mm -hmm. Party. So we got a leading black socialist, early 20th century, a very significant person coming out of the communist movement, mid-century. Here we go. They are both autodidacts, self-educated, working class intellectuals. And I think this is very important because in some ways, I think as is suggested here by George W. Stocking, uh, they can sometimes confront and analyze and assess what's going on without having their brains eaten up in the university, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And by that, I, I, when I say that, I immediately think of this quote from Marx, which I'm sure people here are familiar with, how the dominant, uh, the ruling class, and the ideas of the ruling class are in every epoch, the ruling ideas. And I think that's true, and we see that in what goes on in universities. And just, th I can't emphasize enough how I think that, you know, not only is this the, the most powerful country in the world, but a lot of the ideas, a lot of what I want to talk about today is really going to challenge that. But this is not an easy task, right, to really cut through a lot of this, and that's why it can't be done in just sound bites, because we're fed in so many ways with, I think, a lot of incorrect ideas. Um, Harrison lives, as I said, from 1883 to 27. Now, I'm going to open with Harrison because I think he will help make clear what Allen does later, right? Harrison's from St. Croix in the Virgin Islands. For those not familiar with him, brilliant intellectual, race and class conscious, radical internationalist, called the father of Harlem radicalism by Randolph and others, a Philip Randolph. And I've argued in my two books, he's a key ideological link in the unity of the black liberation movement, the civil rights wing uh, and the uh, race nationalist tendencies, right? J.A. Rogers, world's great man of color, calls him the foremost Afro-American intellect of his era. Um, Randolph calls him the father of Harlem radicalism. Harrison is the only person in U.S. history uh, that I know of, and I think this is accurate, to play signal leading roles in the largest class radical and the largest race radical movement of his era. Leading black activist in the Socialist Party, the founder of the first organization and first newspaper of the New Negro Movement, which in some ways is a precursor to the Black Power Movement 50 years later. And then he becomes editor and principal radical influence on, uh, editor of the Negro World and principal radical influence on the Garvey Movement. Because he's a major radical influence on both A. Philip Randolph and Marcus Garvey, that's where that key link in the ideological <coughs> unity, but if you take those lines of descent down, it is Martin and Malcolm when I grow up, because it's Martin who marches with Randolph at his side, and Malcolm, whose mother was a reporter for the same Negro world that Harrison edited, and father was a Garveyite preacher, right? So these lines. So Harrison is a giant. And both Allen and Harrison, they're autodidacts. When I started out maybe a decade ago, if you did Google searches, you might get 13 on, on Harrison and 85 on Allen. They're up. Allen's 300,000 now or something like that, and Harrison's 130, 140. They are coming because what they say is so important. They speak truth, 
and I think particularly the younger generation who's really looking to address some of these issues, you know, is picking up on them. And um, so please pay attention <laughs> um, as we go on. Uh, briefly on Harrison, just a couple key points, again, to get us to Alan. Harrison arrives from St. Croix in the Virgin Islands in 1900. When he arrives, he encounters a vicious white supremacy, unlike anything he knew down in St. Croix. And he comments on it, and so did so many of the early generation of Anglo-Caribbean, Afro-Anglo-Caribbean, from the Anglo-Caribbean, right? Marcus Garvey from Jamaica, Claude McKay from Jamaica, they all comment mm. similarly. Harrison says he was shocked by what he saw here. McKay phrases it very well. McKay writes, when I came to the United States, it was the first time I'd ever come face to face with such manifest, implacable hatred of my race. I had heard of prejudice in America, but never dreamed of it being so intensely bitter. And to this day, people coming to this country will comment similarly, right? That's true. All right. The difference. I use Harrison St. Croix as an example because I'm most familiar with it. But in St. Croix, the St. Croix that Harrison came from, there was no history of lynch terror, no formal segregation, class promotion among a sector of the African descended population was fostered, <coughs> and white supremacy was not as virulent or as vicious. Why? And this is going to lead, pave the way for Allen, right? Very simply, in St. Croix, the background was of the 100% of the population, when Harrison's growing up, you had 5% European. 80% of the population black, basically plantation laborers, 15% so-called colored of mixed African and European ancestry. In St. Croix, the greatly outnumbered European ruling elite for social control reasons, social control becomes crucial in Allen's analysis, they implemented a policy of promoting a sector of the African descended population. In other words, they wanted to draw the middle element in, because 5% couldn't rule, control 95%, they tried to use that middle element. A similar thing we see happen in Saint-Domingue, in, in Haiti, and that's written about by other scholars, right? And when push comes to shove in that struggle, the free colored side with the plantation labor force leads to, you know, emancipation and independence. But in, during slavery in St. Croix, there was the policy of promotion and land holding for a sector of the African descended population. Hubert Harrison, when he's born in 1883, is actually born on a plantation on an estate owned by two men of color. You would not find that in Virginia and the U.S. for the most part, right? Um, the free coloreds in St. Croix, when, during the period of slavery, the free coloreds served in the militia, which was the principal instrument of social control. And in 1834, they passed a law in St. Croix, an edict of full equality, which at least nominally gave full equality between free coloreds and Europeans. Contrast that with the U.S. The general policy was one of severe racial proscription for all African Americans. There's no promotion, right? Slave patrols in the U.S., the instrument of social control, were lily white, no free coloreds. And the, rather than a, a, a law, an edict of full equality, the law in the U.S. was codified in the Dred Scott decision that no black person has any rights that are white. So I'm trying to suggest it's a qualitative difference in how they maintain social control. All right. In Jamaica, just to drive that point home a little more, on the eve of emancipation in Jamaica, 23% of the African bond laborers, the enslaved population, were owned by people of color. That is totally different than what we see in the U.S., right? All right. Harrison, when he's with the Socialist Party in 1911, he does the first series of pioneering articles on socialism and the Negro question by a black activist, right? Series. He, he, he speaks as many as 23 times a week before 50,000 um, at Union Square. He speaks for four hours, according to the New York Times, at Broad and Wall Street in front of the Stock Exchange in the first Occupy movement, right? But it doesn't get the attention it merits, right? Um, but here in 1911, in this, in this article on the Negro and Socialism, he writes, politically, the Negro is the touchstone of the modern democratic idea. Please remember this concept, touchstone. A touchstone is a black stone 
you rub it against gold to see if the metal is really the gold it's purported to be. Use that as a guide, a rule for all the issues we dress in society. Let's put it to the test. How are black people treated? How are they faring? What are we going to do about it? The Negro is the touchstone. He goes on in that same passage to write essentially, true democracy and equality implies a revolution startling to even think of. What I think he hints at there is the 1960s, the era when I grew up, and maybe some of the other people here, when the civil rights black liberation struggle was a catalyst for every other movement for social change. The anti-war movement, the women's movement, the labor movement, mm -hmm. students' movement, gay and lesbian rights, pick a movement, right? It was a catalyst. Why? Because the struggle was just and because it so directly hit at how the ruling class maintains social control, right? Going on, going quickly. Harrison, in 1912, in the International Socialist Review, leading publication monthly of the Socialist Party, writes, the 10 million Negroes of America form a group that is more essentially proletarian and was Negro under slavery was the most thoroughly exploited of the American proletariat. This concept of enslaved black laborers as proletarians is crucial for Allen's work. We see it early here in Harrison. Slavery as capitalism, slave owners as capitalists, enslaved and chattel bond laborers as proletarians. We see it in Du Bois in 1935 in his work, Black Reconstruction, which reshapes much of our understanding of U.S. history. Uh, and when Du Bois writes, he calls it the kernel in the meaning of the labor movement. White labor movement, with few exceptions, never had the intelligence or knowledge to see in black slavery and reconstruction the kernel and meaning of the labor movement in the U.S. This is very important when we get to Allen, right? Harrison at the Patterson strike, Bill Haywood, Gurley Flynn, I showed this to a few people earlier. Um, he's a really, a truly an extraordinary activist in this whole period. I mentioned some of his talks. Harrison leaves, he was moving to the left when he spoke at Patterson. In 1914, he leaves the Socialist Party, mm -hmm. and when he leaves, he offered what I argue is probably the most profound but least heated criticism in the history of the left, and that's why it's really unfortunate we haven't known more about him because we could have learned these lessons a little more thoroughly. Mm -hmm. And he writes, the Socialist Party, like the labor movement, has insisted on white race first and class after. It put the white race first before class. That leads us directly to the question, what is this white race thing, right? I mean, now, just before we get there, just one more thing on Harrison and race. Here he is in 1926. He's teaching world problems of race at the Institute for Social Studies, but also at the Workers' School of the Communist Party. He's teaching these courses, right? And on the left is Richard B. Moore with the book in his hand, Richard B. Moore of the African Blood Brotherhood, the Socialist Party, the Communist Party, uh -huh. Frederick Douglass Book, your counterpart up in Harlem, the Frederick Douglass Bookstore. Um, in the front row, with, uh, sitting with more books on, in his thing, is W.A. Domingo, for, uh, Socialist, first editor of Garvey's Negro World, goes back and very active in the movement in the Caribbean later on. First row, right over Harrison's head with a black hat, Williana Jones Burroughs, a leading woman in the international communist movement. She's active with Harrison in the early period. Her, her photo, which is in the book here, the Harrison biography, subsequently appeared on the front cover of the Journal of African American History. She's big in the um, meetings of the international trade unionists. She's a New York City school teacher. She, ha she runs a English language program in Moscow for four years during World War II, right? Soviet Union. And in the back row, is Hermie Weisswood, another one active in the international communist movement. She's discussed at great length in a book by Moore's daughter, Joyce Moore Turner, who's still alive, 92, a wonderful historian. It's called Caribbean Crusaders and the Harlem Renaissance. But Joyce Moore Turner also wrote a wonderful book on her father, Richard B. Moore, a Caribbean militant in Harlem, highly recommended. Um, at, in those lectures, here's what Harrison points out. And this is interesting because we're going to see a little similarity in Allen later. The King James Version of the Bible does not contain the word race in our modern sense, which he says suggests as late as 1611, our modern idea of race had not yet arisen. That's just to plant a little seed. We're going to get into that more. All right, here's Alan. This is around the time 
Yet he writes the invention of the white race, I think, that picture. But here's his background very briefly. 1919 to 2005, he's born in Indiana. His family moves to West Virginia. He graduates from Huntington, West Virginia High School. It's the SMSA, the Standard Metropolitan Statistical Area that was, I think, lowest in the country at that time. I mean, he's living, you know, he's living, he's very much proletarianized during the Great Depression. He becomes a coal miner, he becomes president of three UMW locals in West Virginia. Uh, he's also active in Pennsylvania. He's a factory worker, teacher, postal worker, as was Harrison, as was I. So we got the working class thing going here. And at, in the end, his last years, he was librarian at the Brooklyn Public. He did the homework hotline with the students, so he's community involved. He pioneers his white skin privilege analysis in 1965. Allen's white skin privilege analysis is far different than that of Peggy McIntosh, that which many of the younger generation has probably been exposed to, or that which you will read about if you go to uh, Wikipedia and the first thing says white skin privileges hold that all white people benefit from uh, racism. Allen's saying something totally different, and that's what we're going to share with you today. He is also pioneer of the invention of the white race analysis. He first starts coming out with it, 1974, 75, in this little pamphlet. Uh, this is a reprint of it, um, and uh, which is entitled "Class Struggle and the Origin of Racial Slavery: The Invention of the White Race." And it fully comes out in his two-volume work, um, "The Invention of the White Race, Volume One: Racial Oppression and Social Control in 1994, Volume Two: The Origin of Racial Oppression in Anglo-American 1997." We have copies of them here. I just want to tell you, for those who are interested or get sparked by what we do today, we have them here, but they, um, and these new editions, I did the front and back matter, it has greatly expanded index, it has internal study guides, 25 pages for each volume, because these are not easy work. This is, what I, this is what I call serious proletarian scholarship, it's not the kind you find in the academy oftentimes. And, and so it's 30 to 35 percent, 30 to 35 percent indexes and footnotes. Alan treats this stuff seriously, and he wants you to be able to go and pursue what he's laid out before you. And when he takes on, he will take on all of the leading arguments, or virtually all. You know, he, he identifies the arguments, and then he's not mean-spirited. He doesn't call names, he addresses them, mm -hmm. and he goes through it. This is intellectual scholarship, I think, of the highest degree. The book also has greatly expanded <coughs> indexes, and it's got some other front and back matter. And I just want you to know, for those who want to get it, um, there are some copies, I believe, he available here today, Doug, but um, they're also available online from Verso for 40% off, and they are also, when they do that, they are um, bundled, they are shipping for free, and they're bundling the ebook, which may have particularly appeal to the younger generation, people who like to, you know, have that access to it. So, all right, going on with Alan. Some of his other writings, in, in 1967, he writes a very influential pamphlet called White Blind, but he co-authors with Noel Ignatiev, who's from up in this area now. Mm -hmm. And that publication greatly influences SDS, Students for a Democratic Society of my generation, and the new left of the late 60s, early 70s. Um, and uh, people may not know it, again, if they're only familiar with white privilege from the recent generational stuff, but in 1969, the New York Times ran a front page article on how the National Office of Students for a Democratic Society had decided to declare an all-out war on white skin privilege, right? So it was very current back then, very influential. Um, he writes, uh, and key, bundled with that white blind spot, or in that blind, blind spot, art, is an article, Can White Workers Crossed Out Radicals Be Radicalized? I'm going to get into that a little bit today. So it's, and all of this stuff is available on my webpage for free, links to everything, right? I try and put everything up that I can for free. He writes White Supremacy in U.S. History, a number of other articles. He writes a critical review of Edmund uh, Morgan's American Slavery, American Freedom. Morgan is, in, for many, he's, in terms of colonial history, he was the president of the Organization of American Historians. 
That book of Morgan's has been very influential. There is much good in it, but Alan takes him to task on two key issues, which I will discuss. But why you want to pay attention, I think, is Morgan's book is what uh, Michelle Alexander relies on in, in the beginning of her, in, you know, when she's going to refer to the colonial period, she refers, I mean, she's a lawyer, she's not a historian, but she refers to Morgan. And I'm going to point out some of the issues that Alan takes with Morgan, because you might find that interesting. In defense of affirmative action and employment policies, race, race and ethnicity, history in the 2000 census, extremely important because he looks at the Hispanic category and he does a history of how it's been treated in the census and what's going on. And aside, besides all this very rich history and all the different groups that are affected and involved, because uh, people should be familiar, in the U.S. Census now, 2000, 2010, and moving ahead, people of what are the, is, is called Hispanic category, even though, as I pointed out, most of these people broke from Spain, right, and call, you know, refer to themselves otherwise, but the U.S. Census says Hispanic, are given the option to uh, indicate their race. And there's much more beyond that, but the statistics are from 200 to 2010, the percentage of Hispanics identifying as whites went up 3%, and it's going to be going up more in the next decade. We've got to watch this because one of the principal driving forces, as Alan points out in his article, census making is a political action. Mm -hmm. And what's going on with this census is they're restructuring things so that there will be a white majority or at least a white plurality into the foreseeable future. So the illusion, the image of democracy, you know, they can still run that day. Oh, we're very democratic and stuff like that. Please pay attention. This Allen article is very important because right now, two nights ago, I was in New York City. There's all kinds of big money from Ford Foundation, Kellogg Foundation. There, there's all this study now. Make race count. This is what's being pumped in the Latino community, right? Make race count. And the real danger is people identify, I think, one of the real dangers, people identifying as white, right? But, but we, we can talk about that. I mean, I, I realize that after all, Latinos were being discriminated against on the basis. That's, that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about this white identification thing. He does a wonderfully and a very important critical review of David Rodiger's The Wages of Whiteness, Race and the Making of the Working Class. Any people who are familiar with Rodiger, been influenced by him, I think want to read that. Read it carefully. It's, it's again, I think, very insightful. He also, this two-volume work that he does, The Invention of the White Race, he knew how big and heavy and thick it was, so he, he, did, he was thoughtful for his readers, and he wrote a two-volume, sum, uh, a, a two-part summary of it. Each, each part is 50 pages long. But um, it's online for free, so you can access that. And in this pamphlet, the class struggle pamphlet, I do a short intro, which is also available free online, 12 pages, uh, so you get a little taste of what he's trying to do. Um, in, if you go to my webpage, which is down at the bottom, jeffreybperry.net, you'll find all of this stuff. You can remember my name from the event today. In an article, which Joe was the editor of Cultural Logic, which was published um, in Cultural Logic, the 2010 issue, aside from everything we're talking about, I, I, in that article, I think I offer what is the fullest development, treatment of the development of Allen's thought that's been written so far. It's a, very, it's a long article. But in the article, I have a statistical section which I think people would find of value. And the basic points I make in the statistical section, or I try to make, and I keep that very short, is that the gap between rich and poor is extreme and, and worsening, right? The, the gap between rich and poor is at record proportions in this country, right? Two, that poor and working people are suffering deeply. This is very important because some of the arguments like the white privilege argument, oh, you're benefiting from this system. Uh-uh. People are getting crushed, right? Three, comparisons with other advanced countries show how poorly U.S. workers are. And I do some international comparisons. Maternity leave, paternity leave, social safety net, health care, these issues. And I think it's a type of research we want to encourage people to do or type of, you know, analysis we want people to do. You know, similar type things. And of, of course, the fourth point I make is through all of this, there's a white supremacist shaping to, virtue, to every issue you look at, right? To every issue you look at. Housing, unemployment, health care. All right, so you might find that section interesting. Now we get into Allen. On the back of volume one of the original 1994 edition, Allen writes the following. 
When the first Africans arrived in Virginia in 1619, there were no white people there, would, nor would there be, according to the colonial records, for another 60 years. The word white doesn't appear in a Virginia colonial record until 1691. <laughs> And Virginia's the pattern-setting colony. Seven of the first 12 presidents come from there. Let's be clear, right? All right. There were no white people. He, he points out, others living in the colony at the time were English. They've been English when they left England. They and their Virginia-born children were English. They were not white. White identity had to be carefully taught, and it would be another 60 years before the word would appear as a synonym for European-American. Please listen to this. White identity had to be carefully taught. Think of that in terms of what's going on today, too. White identity had to... We, we can get into this. Who, who's telling people, you got to recognize you're white, you know? <laughs> there were no white people there. 1640, John Punch. People may be familiar with John Punch. Ancestry.com, less than two years ago, came out with an article on John Punch, who was a man of African descent, who was a chattel bond servant in Virginia, who ran away with two other people, and when they were captured, he was sentenced to lifetime servitude. The reason Ancestry.com made such a big deal about it is because, because John Punch was related to Barack Obama. But he was not related to Barack Obama on his father's side, he was related to him on his uh, mother's side, which made the twist more interesting, right? But this is the only account of John Punch in the record, 1640, and you see that John Punch ran away, I'm sorry I don't have my pointer here to point it out to you, but he ran away with Victor, a Dutchman, and a Scotchman called James Gregory. Still not white, right? You with me on this? You won't find it, as I said. Bacon's Rebellion is the big event, 1676-77, we'll get into this more. Um, in Bacon's Rebellion, the people at the bottom of society in the second Civil War stage of Bacon's Rebellion, the laboring class people rise up, African American, European American, together, fighting, demanding their freedom from bondage. They burn Jamestown, the capital, they kick out the governor, and they control six-seventh of the colony for nine months, right? And um, this is Bacon's Rebellion. Here's the account uh, from Captain Thomas Grantham, who's sent to put down the rebellion. And Grantham writes, in the final stages, I there met 400 English and Negroes in arms. Still not white, right? English and Negroes in arms. And some were for shooting me and others for cutting me in pieces. I <laughs> promised them that they were all free from their slavery. And in the final stages, 80 Negroes and 20 English would not deliver their arms. Still not white, right? Mm -hmm. Here's Alan's main thesis, if we, if we run short on time at the end. <laughs> Here's Alan's main thesis, three prongs, please pay attention. One, the white race was invented as a ruling class social control formation in response to labor solidarity as manifested in the latter Civil War stages of Bacon's rebellion. rebellion. Ruling class social control formation. The notion of race as a social construct, they throw that all around in the academy nowadays. Allen says not good enough. If you say race is a social construct and leave it there, you leave the back door open for Daniel Patrick Moynihan and Dinesh D'Souza who will say, yeah, it's a social construct, but what would you expect from inferior family life? or inferior cultural background, right? Alan says, no, you've got to put it where it belongs, at the ruling class, right? That's whose interest it serves, that's who developed it, right? Alan goes on to explain how this is done. He says, a system of racial privileges was deliberately, conscious ruling class policy, deliberately instituted by the late 17th, early 18th century Anglo-American bourgeoisie in order to define and establish the white race and establish a system of racial oppression. We're going to get into what racial oppression is, but I want to call to your attention since we're at the Marxist Center. Allen, with all his Marxist background, he taught at the Jefferson School for years, political economics, he is developing an analysis of racial oppression. We're familiar with Marxist analysis of national oppression or gender. He is developing an analysis of racial oppression, right? Huh. All right. The, Third, and this is crucial for Allen's analysis, and this is where he differs from the Peggy McIntoshes and others, the consequence 
was not only ruinous to the interest of African Americans, the consequences of this system of white race privileges was not only ruinous to African Americans, but it was disastrous for the European American workers. The workers. We know the ruling class benefits from this system, right? But the wor it's not in their interest. And he's trying to get people to fight against it, right? And so we're going to get into this and more. So, and he emphasizes, and later we'll get into some of his arguments, the position of the laboring class vis-a-vis -vis the rich and powerful was not improved, but it was weakened by the system of white skin privilege. So what Allen is arguing over the course, I'm giving you this up front, then we're going to get into how he gets there. That the white race is a ruling class social control formation, not simply a social construct. I've made that point, I hope. It is no part of genetic evolution. This white race thing, it's not about biology and genetics. Just like the census is political, this white race formation is political, right? White supremacism, he is going to argue in this and many of the writings which we're going to go into, has been the Achilles heel of the labor, democratic, and socialist movements in this country. White race and class collaboration. I come out of the labor movement, you come out of the labor movement, right? right. The worst thing you can be in the labor movement is a class collaborator. Now, Alan <laughs> says this white race, this white race is a formation that includes the ruling class and the laboring class to serve the ruling class interests. So he says the white race held together by racial privileges, the key is the racial privileges to the laboring class, because it's against their interest, is the most basic, prevalent, and historic form of class collaborationism in this country. Going on. White identity. Here's where Alan gets deeper. This is why I didn't want to cut this one short today. Mm -hmm. The main barrier to class consciousness in the U.S. is the incubus of white identity. White worker concept. If you think you're white, you side with the boss. We want to emphasize the worker. We don't want to emphasize that white, right? Got to break from that white. Separate the workers from the white. This is what he's arguing, right? So that's just a little where we're going with this. Getting a little pumped here. Ted Allen, okay. This is what he probably looked like. I remember exactly. But I first met him in the late 60s. But this is around the time he's writing that white blind spot thing, you know. And now here's a little of his history of how he comes to write all of this stuff. Again, he's a coal miner, hurts his back in the mine, comes up to New York, teaches at the Jefferson School, political economics. That's a Marxist school like this, only much bigger. Right? And, um, uh, you know, he's teaching this. He, he's a key figure in some of the major conferences they do in the 50s. He leaves with a, a left offshoot after the Krus, uh, Khrushchev revelations, you know, in the 50s. There's people leaving the uh, Communist Party. He leaves. Uh, with some others in a group called the Provisional Organizing Committee. Oh, did he? Yes. Oh. And he's a leading theoretician in that group, but he, he's writing under the pseudonym of Molly Pitcher at the time, right? Oh. And um, but then in the early '60s, he starts going. He, you know, he gets. He's not going to stay with that, and he kind of goes independent, and he starts trying to think things through anew for himself, right? So here he is in the mid '60s, and he talks how the uh, he he starts out. He has a fascination with history. He's identified, as long as he can remember, with the ordinary people. And he has a conviction that racial discrimination is wrong. That's, that's the basic building blocks he's working off of. It was a changed ambiance of the African-American civil rights struggle, peace movement, etc. Remember that early quote about the autodidacts, how sometimes they capture the essence of their period in a very direct way? I think this is the case in Allen. I think it's also the case with Harrison during World War I era, right? Um, so he starts probing the possibility, could it be, the, could it be possible defeat suffered by democratic, progressive, populist, and socialist movements in this history of this country, and the riddle of American exceptionalism. If you've heard the phrase American mm -hmm. exceptionalism, right. traditionally what it's referred to is why does the U.S. seem to be exempt from the normal course of class struggle, you know, as in other capitalist countries. Mm -hmm. and so could he's arguing he's he's probing could it be found in white supremacism could this be the key to understanding this and he says Du Bois had planted that seed some 30 years early in black reconstruction so in 1965 he sets out to investigate three great previous crises civil war and reconstruction is one populist revolt of the 1890s is two and great depression of 1930s is three and that's why that article that I wrote went in the uh, uh, journal that Joe edited the developing conjuncture, this fourth crisis that's 
bit by bit developing, right? Uh, and I wanted to address that and build off this a little. Now, in the three previous crises, here's what Allen finds. These three crises I just identified. The key to the defeat of forces of democracy, labor, and socialism was in each case achieved by ruling a class appeals to white supremacism, basically by fostering white skin privileges of the laboring class European Americans. I'm going to cite the Great Depression very briefly because it's the most recent, but I think it, it's, it's very clear, you know, but he, he makes arguments in, uh, in the other two crises too. The Great Depression, and you still hear people today say, oh, we need a New Deal, FDR type New Deal, that's the way we move forward, right? And so Allen says, no way, right? First, each and every program from the New Deal into the 1960s, each and every federal program was shaped in a white supremacist fashion. Why? Because the basic troika of support of FDR, the three prongs were the labor unions, the corrupt de democratic machines in the cities, and the Dixiecrats down south, the same people who were in the Tea Party and the Republican Party today, shaping all that policy. So I come out of the labor movement. You look at the basic labor legislation of this country, Fair Labor Standards Act, National Labor Relations Act, Social Security until 1951, they exclude domestic and agricultural workers. 70% oh. of your black and Latin workforce. Going on, um, that's the labor legislation. Relief, it's federal money, it's controlled locally. Great disparities, and particularly down south. Here's the big one, the GI Bill. I'm born in the Bronx. My family moves to New Jersey, right? But it's the same up here. The GI Bill, you can get a home with zero down payment and low interest loan. The statistics for New York, New Jersey area where I live, 67,000 GI loans are awarded. Less than 100 go to families of color. That's how you get the ring of white suburbs around New York and every city in this country. Conscious ruling class policy. And here's the fourth one, and I can't emphasize this one enough, and I'd like to see people taking up this issue a little more. The black to white unemployment ratio. Everybody knows oh, yeah. it's two to one or some variant of this. But it wasn't always that way. In 1929, at the start of the Great Depression, the black to white unemployment ratio was one to one, which makes sense if you think about it, because black laborers are brought here to work. Mm -hmm. By 1947, after all the programs of the New Deal and the post-war deployment, redeployment, it was two to one, and that's all we've ever known, as long as anybody in this room has been alive. Ruling class policy. You get this? All right. Everybody okay? We doing all right? Yeah. All right. Here we go. So, and uh, we do more on this, but I'm, I'm going to skip. Now, Alan offers one other little thing in this period. He suggests that the history of class struggle in the U.S., this is just a little offering he makes, could briefly be interpreted in a five-stage cycle. Normal course of capital events brings deterioration of conditions of workers. Substance of the white workers' race privileges in stage two at a certain period starts to erode, you know, it gets attacked. All of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but the white workers in, the, in that situation start making overtures to let's have some unity, fellow brothers and sisters, you know, we're getting crushed here. And what has historically happened in stage four, he argues, is the ruling class has re-upped the uh, white race privileges and stuff like that, that the European American workers have unfortunately taken what he calls the poison bait. Allen says that white race privileges for the European American workers are a poison bait. They're like a shot of heroin. They may look good, but they're killing you and your class interest, right? This is very important, very different than that other stuff. And so that's what he argues. I just wanted to get that out. Now, when he starts writing these essays in this period, Allen's a Marxist. He wants social change. He wants socialism come, right? So he's addressing the questions, and this is of great relevance, again, here at the Marxist Center. Why no socialism in the U.S.? Why this relatively low level of class consciousness in this U.S.? And why 100 years after emancipation is white supremacy so strong? So these are some of the questions in, his back, in the background. And on the question of why no socialism, he reviews the literature that's current in this period, and he argues that basically there's a consensus from the left and labor historians 
a six-pronged rationale. Now, if you want to see this in its core, go to William Z. E. Forster's History of the Communist Party. You're going to find it in there. But it's in these other writers, too. I'm going to show you in a second. But the six-pronged rationale that are used to explain the low level of class consciousness, early right to vote, the heterogeneity of the workforce, free land safety valve, higher wage, social mobility. These are what you know these historian and labor historians have put forward. Now, look who they are. He's ready to take them all on. Engels, Sorg, who translates capital into Eng English, right? Eli Hilquit, Foster, dominant figure in the Communist Party, Commons, Perlman, and these are the people, and he cites, and you, you, if you go to the articles, you, you'll, you can get the citations, right? Uh, so that, that's where he's getting this from, and what he argues, he challenges that old consensus, and he counters with his own s theory. He says, basically, look, at that six-pronged rationale is more myth than reality, and when you look more closely, because he goes, the free land safety valve, it wasn't working people getting that free land, it's going to railroads and things like this. He goes one by one through all of them, mm -hmm. and he talks, he counters with his own super, uh, theory that white supremacy reinforced amongst European Americans was the main retard of class consciousness, and efforts at social change have to address this, right? It, it, it related to that is the question of why no Labor Party, why yeah. no significance left. And again, it's, he's offering that same analysis, right? In the course of that, he also challenges, and this is where Allen's very good, this is in the 1967 to 69 period. He takes on the arguments, he's, he's arguing that central to efforts at social change is struggle against white supremacy. Mm -hmm. But there are all kinds of arguments that come up then as they come up now. So he, he categorizes them, and he calls them the artful dodges, right? And I'm not going to go, I didn't want to go through all six, because I knew I was very consciously trying to keep this down. But one is level up, don't level down. You'll hear this from some groups on the left. You know, don't take anything away, right? You know, we, of course, what happens with that two to one black to white unemployment is that the white skin privilege policy goes in terms of the jobs too, right? Whites are first hired, last fired. So if you're not going to take anything away, so he argues, you know, that the level up, level down is typified by fair employment through full employment. He says you're not going to get there unless you're prepared to deal with this. And as someone who's worked in the workplace and knows the situation, when you're going to try and bring workers together, they're going to come at you hard sometimes, and they might try and hit some people hard, right? And we've got to be ready to stick together, to fight back, you know, and, and that's it. And on these issues, he's saying we've got to step forward and challenge all of these policies. Now, another one, and this one you'll find in uh, one writer who's very current today, start talking about short-term and long-term interest. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe in the uh, in the short term, obviously the interest, obviously quite, that's a quote, right? Obviously, the interest of white workers and black workers aren't the same. But in the long term, yeah, they, down the road they will. And says we're never going to get down the road unless we start addressing this inequality now, right? Um, so he's calling for a need for a direct attack, and this is in the period 67, 68, 69. Again, he emphasizes the privileges are a poison bait. They do not permit the masses of European American workers nor their children to escape from that class, the working class, right? Uh, two essential poli uh, points about race privilege policy, deliberate bourgeois class policy, and contrary to services appearances, the uh, they are contrary, the privileges are contrary to the interests not only of black workers, but European American workers. So Allen is then arguing, and he writes an essay on this, the most vulnerable point. He argues that white supremacy, the most vulnerable point at which a decisive blow can be struck against uh, bourgeois rule in the U.S. is white supremacy. Why? Because it is white supremacy that they rely on to maintain social control, and that's the issue we have to beat them back on. So this is where his movements... And when he's still writing this, this is 72, 73, he's still in the old mold of the Communist Party language and things like this, because there's some changes come along. He talks about repudiation, and repudiation, he understands, is a throwing off. It's just not going to go away. You've got to challenge this stuff, and it's not a single one-act thing. It's, you know, day in, day out. And we can talk about this more. I can talk in terms of the work we did in the post office. Struggle against white supremacy and imperialism totally linked. He emphasizes that. The slide's up there. People can read in more detail. Coming back to the history of Allen's book. After five years of working on this analysis of the history of the three crises, 
he, he, a new book appears by Winthrop D. Jordan. The book is entitled White Over Black, American Attitudes Towards the Negro, 1550 to 1812. This is the response from the Academy to the Civil Rights Black Liberation Struggle. This is the ideological counter, right? And it gets reinforced, and everybody starts citing Jordan. And what Jordan basically argues is racism, white supremacy, is an unthinking decision. Huh. It's automatic, right? You know, and it, it would the shoe, if the shoe were on the other foot, it would be the same way, right? This is the Alan considers this the core argument that we've got to deal with—that racism is innate. But there's a second argument. The first one is the Jordan argument: racism is innate. But the second argument is one that comes out. I'll show you where it comes from in a second. That the white workers benefit from white race privilege, and this is what Alan's going after and challenging, right? And this is what makes his analysis so different from that which we are familiar. Now, Jordan is, in terms of colonial history, Jordan is the basis for the first argument that racism is innate. In terms of the second argument that white workers benefit, it's Morgan. And what Morgan argues is that in Virginia, in the, uh, in the 1700s, there were too few free poor to matter. That's his quote. That's what's going on in St. Croix. That's not what's going on in Virginia. You got poor whites throughout the South, right? And this is this is so. And Alan Alan goes after Morgan. He, um, Can you say that again. Too few free poor. Here's the quote: There were too few free poor European Americans on hand to matter. He gets into another argument about the American paradox, which if we get a chance, we'll discuss later. Which is another one that has shaped much of American history. And I do want to discuss that, so maybe we remember to do that in later on. So here's his two volumes. And they come out, as I said, 94 and 97. Pay, please pay attention to the titles. Alan's very precise with his words. I'm going to take you on a little trip regarding the words, too. His precision on words. Origin of racial oppression in Anglo-America. Alan's precision with words. Origin, not origins. Why does Alan use origin of racial oppression, not origins? Well, he explains. It has the desired specificity. Darwin's origin of species, Engels' origin of the family private property. He goes, my book, I use origin because class struggle is the origin of racial oppression. This is a class struggle approach to history, right? It's a response to class struggle, right? Alan says more things. Whiteness, this is a phrase that's current out there all over the academy and lots of places. He puts it in quotes and shies away from it. He says it's an abstract noun. It's not the role that people play. Uh, and he says the white race is an actual objective thing, not biological, but it functions, right? And it's, uh, it's a historically developed identity. To slough it off or under the heading of whiteness, he says, seems to get away from the basic white race identity trauma, the damage that is done by this white race identity. And finally, for 14 years on the back cover of the book, be, and See, origin, whiteness, and, and, and racism. That is the third word. For 14 years, on the back cover of the book, there was a description of Allen's two-volume work as a history of the origins, plural, of, um, of uh, racism. That's, that's what, how the book was described, and it's by the author of The Wages of Whiteness. Allen doesn't use whiteness. He doesn't use origins. And here he writes, look, my book is not about racism. My book is what is titled. It's the invention of the white race. He's trying to analyze what is this white race thing. We've got to go after it, and, right? So just, and all of this, these, this definition stuff is in my article, so you can find it and think about it more. OK, here's volume one. We'll go another 25 minutes, Joe, something like that. We, good, we're good. All right. OK, volume one, I've, I've told you what's on the back cover. Um, Alan writes in the acknowledgement in in the beginning of his book his acknowledgement section and here he is here's what he looks like right he writes he first I acknowledge my obligation to two fellow proletarian intellectuals Charles Johnson and William Carlotti who cleared away ideological barnacles and taught me to say I am not white right think about that I I don't know I, I got a census uh, questionnaire this year I don't know if anyone else here did would they ask you to identify your race? I don't know how people handle that, but we can talk about that. 
Allen argues there's nothing positive in the white race. It's a ruling class social control formation. There's nothing positive in identifying as white. In his personal and political life, he tried to not to think and tried not to think or act white. He explained the white race is now and always has been nothing other than a bourgeois social control formation. He considered special obligation of European Americans to resign from that social control formation and to become a born-again proletarian. He added resigning does not necessarily entail entering another racial or national ca category. Um, uh, but he goes, you, you know, he, he would use, you know, if, if, if people felt more comfortable, European-American or something like that, but he, he's, he's not going to identify as white. All right, volume one is written, it's more theoretical. Volume two is going to focus on 17th century Virginia. He wants to uh, clear some of the barnacles and, and deal with the, con uh, free the conceptual groundwork of the white blind spot, how white supremacism hinders our analysis of what really is going on and went on. So in the introduction, Allen reviews the historical debate on the relationship of racism and slavery as it's been described. And what he does is he, um, the debate is which came first, racism or, or slavery, and he breaks the uh, analysis and the historical writing into two broad categories. One is the psychocultural school, which includes Winthrop Jordan, a fellow named Carl Degla, and the other are those who provide more of a socioeconomic analysis. And that includes uh, Eric, Edmund Morgan, whom we mentioned before, Eric Williams from Trinidad, the Hanlons, Timothy Breen. Allen aligns more with the socioeconomic analysis, but he finds that there are limitations in each of the analyses they offer. And he goes through them. Again, not mean spirited, but he offers his comments. Of all the people writing on this period, he finds the one author who he thinks really gets it the best is Lerone Bennett, Jr. If people are not familiar with Lerone Bennett, Jr., senior editor of Ebony Magazine for many years, author of Before the Mayflower, but this is from his book, The Shaping of Black America. And he does a wonderful chapter, which appeared in Ebony, uh, on the road not taken. It deals with that 17th century Virginia period that Allen does also. Allen goes on to look, I'm going very quickly now, he looks at some of the howling absurdities of race as it's, come, as it's been uh, defined. He talks about colonial Hispanic America, Brazil, where it said money whitens, U.S., no such whitening. He talks about 1890 siblings uh, from, in Portugal. One could go to British Guiana, uh, current, uh, to nowadays Guyana, right? British Guiana back then. And another could come to the U.S., one would be defined as not white, one would be defined as white. Another example, Cuba, same country, same year. Spanish are on the way out. Well, they, they're out, and the U.S. is coming in with their census. 1907, in this last Spanish census, Mexican Indians and Chinese classified as white. In Cuba, when the U.S. comes in, that's not the way we do it. They're classified as colored. Virginia law, one quarter, one sixteenth, one drop, and it's like that through other states and stuff. He goes through a lot of the howling absurdities. So what he's got to do then, after showing all this, he says, you got to cut through the phenotypes, the skin color. You got to look at the nature of the oppression. He's going to analyze racial oppression, right? So he views racial oppression as sociogenic rather than phylogenic, not based on skin color. And he's going to focus not on why the bourgeoisie would have recourse to slavery, because he's very clear. The bourgeoisie, if they can get away with it, they will do it. And in his work, he talks about how in England, the English, on other English from 1547 to 1550, English vagrants, they imposed slavery on the, the English on English. How in Scotland, from the early 1600s to the 1790, the salt pan miners and the coal yeah. workers enslaved. Skin types not, he talks about the Irish slave trade, so-called Irish slave trade. So he knows they will do it if they can get away with it. The question is not will they do it or why would they do it if they think they can profit, but how can they maintain social control? Key, right? And he views racial slavery in continental America as a particular form of racial oppression. This is where this analysis of racial oppression comes in because what Allen is going to argue is what develops in the U.S. is racial oppression. What develops in Jamaica, Barbados, is national oppression. Different types of social control, right? 
All right, the anatomy of racial oppression, and he, he says, by examining racial oppression as a particular system like gender oppression or class oppression or national oppression, we can get to the nature of it. So it's a real Marxist approach, I think, right? And firmer footing for analyzing and fronting the theory that ra racial oppression can be examined in terms of phenotype. He's trying to move beyond that, you know, get locked into skin color to look at what's going on so we can probe more deeply and analyze what has gone on. And in order to do that, he looks in the Irish mirror, mm -hmm. the Irish history, and what he finds, and this is what he does in volume one, that Irish history affords insights into American racial oppression and white supremacy because he argues that Irish history presents a case of racial oppression without reference to skin color. Irish are the That's same color, if you will, as the English, right? And he says the treatment afforded them uh, embodies all the characteristics of racial oppression you'll find in terms of what goes on with African Americans, right? So Allen's core argument in volume one, but I encourage people to read this, you know, don't take my word for it. Read it. He documents primary sources, appendices, very detailed. Anglo-Norman rule and Protestant ascendancy in Ireland. And here's another one I want you to pay attention to. He's saying they developed racial oppression in Ireland in two periods. Protestant ascendancy from the 1650s, 1690s, Protestants on, but earlier under Anglo-Norman rule in the 1300s. That's pre-capitalism. Mm -hmm. Some people say, oh, all this stuff developed only with capitalism. Oh, yeah. He, he's arguing you have to look at the nature of the oppression. But he argues that the treatment in Ireland of the Irish and white supremacy in continental Anglo-America demonstrates that racial oppression is not dependent on skin type, right? That's an argument he makes. And with examples. And then some of the examples of racial oppression that he, he puts forth include African Americans in the U.S., both pre- and post-emancipation. When I told you, please don't pay attention to the blurb on the back cover of the book, volume two, the Verso editor is implying that Allen says racial oppression ends with emancipation. It doesn't. He says it gets reconstituted after the Civil War and Reconstruction, racial oppression, right? Um, he says another example of racial oppression is American Indians, but not in the beginning, not in Virginia in the beginning. He says it's later on, and he goes into why he makes that argument. And the Irish from the early 13th century and then after 1652. All right. Four defining characteristics of racial oppression. When he goes into it, he describes, he offers some hallmarks, some defining characteristics, declassing legislation, deprivation of civil rights, illegalization of literacy, and displacement of family rights. I just want to point out, each of these four characteristics back then has its modern day version today. We're still dealing with these, right? All right. Hallmark of racial oppression, reduction of all members to one undifferentiated social status beneath that of any member of the... That's the Dred Scott decision, right? No black person has any rights. Now, where the option was for racial oppression, Allen argues, because he's a Marxist and he's analyzing this all the time, a successful policy for the oppressor for the bourgeoisie was one that could maximize the return on capital investment while assuring a system of social control, right? This is, the bourgeoisie has two tasks, all, he's arguing all the time, they want to make profit, they got to maintain social control. And they will do it in different ways. They will have racial oppression, they will have national oppression, they have straight class, you know, whatever, whatever it takes. And he's going to talk, you know, one second, we'll see what he says about Ireland again. So the general principles of social control um, after establishing, con uh, oh, did I skip where they found the developed and well-defined uh, differences? Okay, I, I want to get to this. Uh, forgive me for jumping there. But differences in social control, the intermediate social control, here's what he says, racial oppression, the key to maintaining social control is the laboring elements from the oppressor group. Under national oppression, the key to maintaining social control is the element from the oppressed group that gets promoted into that intermediate status, if you will. That's key differences. Uh, in Virginia, he says there was no, no persons of discernible non-European, persons of discernible non-European ancestry were denied a role in social control, whereas in the Caribbean, the so-called mulattoes were promoted, born on an estate that's owned by men of color. That's why 23% of the enslaved population in Jamaica, upon the emancipation, owned by... It's a different system of social control, right? 
And it's rooted in the objective fact that in the West Indies there were too few laboring class. The demographics which influenced the, uh, the struggle in the Caribbean, these small islands, and particularly the Anglo-Caribbean, and they're producing sugar, which is capital intensive. It needs mm. big plantations. The poor farmers, what, you know, even after they get emancipated from their bondage or whatever, they can't compete with the big sugar plantations. So they, they flee oftentimes, right? Um, so Allen argues, and here's where he gets even deeper into this question of racial oppression, national oppression, and not being based on phenotype. He says, the British West Indies and Ireland demonstrate the relativity of race. In both cases, the colonial ruling power, faced with a combination of insurrectionary pressures, resol resolved the situation by decision to recruit elements of the oppressed group. In Ireland, what Allen argues is the British are racially oppressing the Irish. There's a struggle from the Irish, and at a certain point in the late 1700s, early 1800s, they concede, if you will, to allow a role for the Irish national bourgeoisie. So they allow for Ireland, what we call Ireland today, but they maintain the bedrock of racial oppression in Ulster, right? So they, they yes. have national oppression in Ireland, racial oppression in Northern Ireland. In the, Ang in the Caribbean, they, they can ad adapt to national oppression. They still control, right? Just a different form of, whereas in Anglo-America, they maintain racial oppression. So he's trying to argue on the relativity of uh, all of these means of social control. The, so national oppression in the West Indies, racial oppression in the U.S. So when I showed you that Harrison quote earlier, or Claude McKay, they're coming from that situation in the Caribbean, right? Where people of African descent play prominent roles. And that's why Harrison uh, talk, Alan calls it the culture shock. Harrison writes in a letter to the New York Times that he's shocked by what he encounters here. I read you the McKay quote earlier. Just finishing up volume one, and again, I'm going very fast. Alan argues a few more things. He goes, after the Civil War and emancipation, the ruling elite of the country as a whole opted to maintain the system of social control that had been developed in the South based on white privileges and white supremacy. And he goes through all of that, and he talks particularly about how it's implemented in terms of land policy, immigration policy, and industrial employment, right? Mm -hmm. Very good stuff. I think people want to read it. And he talks also about the Irish sea change. He calls it a sea change. And this gets into what we were talking about before in terms of Latinos also. But when he, he talks about the Irish sea change, he talks about how the Irish are victims of racial oppression in Ireland. They hate the British with a passion, right? They support abolition of African Americans. And they come here, and within two generations, they become white defenders of the slaveocracy, opponents of abolition, Thank Within you. two generations, and but he talks about how where the driving force is that, and the plantation elite and related financial interests. Fernando Wood, the mayor of New York, is all tied in with the slaveocracy and the financial interests there. The Catholic Church hierarchy, Irish American establishment, Tammany Hall. So he goes mm -hmm. through this. This is again to show the relativity of race, victims of racial oppression. Now all of a sudden, all right. So he ends. And here's what he's done in volume one. And this is the more theoretical general approach. He's shown religious, religio-racial oppression against Irish Catholics in Ireland, national oppression in the Anglo-Caribbean, racial oppression in continental Anglo-America, down south, right? This is all from the same bourgeoisie, this English bourgeoisie, right? They, they, they'll go with whichever way they got to go, right? How they will transform racial oppression into national oppression in Ireland, right? And the same people who were victims of racial oppression in Ireland became white American defenders. This is to show the relativity of race, racial and national oppression. I think it's a very deep analysis. Now here's volume two. It's going to take 15 minutes more. Are we okay? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. This he considers right. his most important work. This he worked on for 30 years, right? Wow. And this is serious stuff. He's down there. Primary research in Virginia. So here we go. He turns to Jane, to the Anglo. Uh, he turns to Virginia in particular, but also does some North Carolina, some Maryland, mostly uh, Maryland and, and Virginia, mostly Virginia, from Jamestown in 1607 to 1750. Key dates: 
1622, reduction of chattel bond laborers. 1676, seven, Bacon's Rebellion, which we briefly mentioned earlier. 1705, when they start revising some of the laws in Virginia in particular. He reviews the English background. I think this is important, and again, he's a well-versed and trained Marxist economist. So what he's bringing in is very important because he talks about the transition to capitalist agriculture in England, particularly in the 1500s to 16th century. He talks about, as I mentioned before, English attempts by legislation to reduce a portion of their own population to slavery and how these efforts failed. Basically, there's class struggle, there's a fight back, and English labor law is codified in 1563 in the Statute of Artificers, which holds that English labor, the basic English labor law is they're going to be free, they're going to be paid wages. That's the law of England that these colonists are going to be bringing to Virginia. So when they come, there's no slavery, they're bringing the laws from England, right? All right, key difference in the labor supply. One thing that Allen is going to point out, and this is important when we look at Latin America, and, and uh, particularly Latin America, uh, and the Caribbean, the French Caribbean, places like this, and um, the Anglo-Caribbean and Anglo-America. England alone, of all the European colonizing powers, was explore, exporting its own laborers, right? I mean, they, 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 that's what they're doing. They're shipping their own. The French tried engage, what they called engage labor for a while. It didn't work. The Portuguese, Span, Spanish are coming as conquistadors, right? They're not sending their laborers, right? This is key because these demographics are going to play an important part in terms of what develops here in the U.S. Essentially what's going to happen, just to point ahead a little bit, because there are so many laboring class Europeans here, they can't be promoted up to the upper class because that would cut too deeply into profits. So they're going to be sold this bill of goods about the white race. That's, what, that's looking ahead a little. We'll get there. All right. So England's unique position re-labor supply. It had a surf because of that early development of capitalism in agriculture in England, right? Netherlands is different. It's, it's not the same type, you know, transformation in some degree, but England is really in the lead in this. And what's crucial for people to know is up until the 1670s, to bring laborers to Virginia for the English, it was cheaper to bring them from England than you know, other places, right? This was their cheap, yeah, this was their cheapest, because they didn't have control of the African slave, uh, Africa, what's called the African slave trade. Right. They didn't even set up the Royal African Company until the 1670s, right? So for England, they wanted to populate these plantations in Virginia, it's English laborers, in some degree, I have, but mostly English that they're going to be bringing. But watch what happens to them. Uh, so one aspect, the peculiarity of the English labor supply was not the cause, but it was an essential condition for the origin of the peculiar institution. Now, peculiar institution, for those who have studied a little U.S. history, there's a fellow named Kenneth Stamp some years ago wrote a book about the peculiar institution, it's about slavery. Allen stands Stamp on his head like he stands Morgan on his head and all these people. He says, nah, the real peculiar institution in the U.S. is the white race. Right. See, the, the slave always used to refer to slavery. They, they didn't even want to call it by its name. And they would, with a snide, snide snicker and a wink and stuff, refer to our peculiar institution. But Alan says what's really the peculiar institution in this country is this white race thing that they create, which it, it, you know, really is developed here. Right? So let's, we'll go on. Peculiarity of racial slavery was in the buffer social control system. It's mainly supplied. This is what's peculiar about the social control they developed in Virginia. It's mainly supplied from the mass of free proletarians and semi-proletarians as it develops and it excludes all persons of any degree of discernible non-European ancestry. That's what's particularly peculiar about what happens. In this second volume, he does important sections on African migration and the peopling of America, including important indice, uh, appendices. And he talks about the migration but the numbers, 10 to 11 million Africans, most people do not realize that more Africans than Europeans came to the Americas from 1500 to 1800. So it's a significant shaping role in the Americas. He talks about African migration and resistance, pays particular attention to the Haitian Revolution and of its impact on the British West Indies, the US, Cuba, and Brazil, but also, and this is crucial, it is from Haiti that Simone Bolivar twice 
goes and then departs in his efforts to bring, you know, to fight liberation struggles in South America, right? Wow. So the interconnection between the African and Latino, right? Going back to Virginia now, the 1606 Virginia Car uh, Charter, this is when they set it up for Jamestown, that's it. They're going to have all the rights, liberties, franchises, and immunities of free denizens and natural subjects of England. Wages will be paid, labor is free. That's how Virginia is set up, right? No slave, no, no, no slavery. First Africans don't even come, and they're not enslaved when they first come, right? Colonial Virginia. Was it capitalism? Allen has no doubt. He goes through, he talks about what their money, he goes in detail about what they do, but it's not simply what their backgrounds are, how it's set up. Rents, traffic, the prospects, uh, prospectus promised investors 33 and a third percent return. Quotes John Smith, all their aim was nothing but present profit. And he goes on and on. That's in terms of that background, but he gets into the relations of production also. And this is what's really important about his work, because he knows that analysis, right? Plantations were capitalist enterprises. He's very, and why this is important, because when the Communist Party, amongst other reasons, when the Communist Party starts developing national question analysis in the late 1920s and 30s, mostly imported from Soviet nationality theory, the explanations on the U.S. that you'll see in James S. Allen and Harry Haywood are phrases like semi-feudal peasantry and things like this. He's saying, no, let's be clear, this is capitalism. We've got to understand what we're dealing with. No, so its production was mon monopolized by one class. Non-owners were reduced to absolute dependence on the owners and could live only by the alienation of their labor power. The products of the plantation took the form of commodities, and the aim of production was the accumulation and expansion of capital. All right. The Powhatan Indians were the, nat were the Native Americans in the area of Jamestown when the settlement occurs. In the first decade or, decade or two, they had the preponderance of power. You had a little similar thing up here in New England for a while, right? And actually, the period 1609, 1610, it was called the starving period down around Jamestown because the colonists couldn't get, get by, and in, as, as happens elsewhere, right? The Native Americans saved them and helped pull them through it, right? But the Native American population in Jamestown, certain key things about it, they could not be surrounded because one of the unique things about the U.S., but you see it also in Brazil, but it's, you don't see it so much in um, the Caribbean, is there's a great continental expanse. So there's avenues, you know, if the, if the Europeans come and try and impose some unfavorable conditions on Native Americans, they can just get it, you know, we're, we're leaving, right? But it's not so easy in the Caribbean, right? So they could not be surrounded, they could not be exterminated as in island colonies, and they could not be brought under that degree of administrative control. So when the English come, if they want to even develop plantations, right, English, the Native American labor force is not going to be it. They also were not, in Virginia, it was not such a hierarchical structure as you saw with the Aztecs and the Incas in Peru where they were able to utilize the existing social structure. Alan goes into all of this in some detail. Um, the Powhatan were well provisioned, as I said, they shared with the uh, English in the early period. We see in the early period as they start to develop plantations, right, to produce tobacco, right? Tobacco is the crop down in Virginia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we see some early efforts to bring intermediate forms of servitude. People coming with less than full rights, even though there's the full rights of the English. But these are coming from England. And they're bringing imprisoned convicts, or Ireland. Yeah, yeah, they'll ship yeah. some from Ireland, but it's still mostly England in this period. Yeah. Vagrants, maids for wives, women to be matched up and paired up. Duty boys, that's youth, brought out of the youth homes and stuff on a ship called the Duty, right? So this is who they're bringing, and, they're put, and they have less than full status at first. But this is still before the first Africans come, right? First Africans are 16, 19. Wow. So they got, they got no qualms about doing this, right? And, <laughs> and see, Alan's a worker. Alan's clear. He knows the bourgeoisie will do this, you know? Are they He's a coal miner. Huh? Not quite. No, we're going to get in. Indentured servants is a, great, is a great misnomer. In, I mean, uh, we're going to get into that because indenture is a signed contract, willingly yeah. signed. Yeah, the majority do not come. The majority in 17th century Virginia are not indentured. We've wow. been taught since we were long, yeah. young, indentured yeah. servants and slaves. Right. Step back. We're going through that. Yeah. Oh. It's not that kind of party, right? Yeah. Intermediate bond servitude. Okay, so they're coming, and this is in the early period, so before the first Africans. 
First Africans come, August 16, 19. They're actually, whatever their status was on the seas, on the high seas, when they get to Virginia, they're not slaves because there's no slavery in Virginia. With me on this, right? Mm -hmm. Now, at that time, there's correspondence between the, the colonial elite and England, you know, over the running of the colony and stuff. And they're complaining here that there's a shortage of food in Virginia and they need more supply, blah, blah. Yet they trade victuals for the, for the African slaves, which, you know, shows that they'll talk out of both sides of their mouth. But that shows, as Alan points out, that they're trying to create an oversupply of labor, you know, to just drive conditions down further. So first arrivals. Here's a key event. So you've got mostly English, some very, very small amount of Africans, and mostly everyone basic capitalist relations of production. The key relations of production in terms of work amongst laboring people were tenants at halves and wage laborers. Both capitalist relations of production. A tenant at half, if you had an agreement where you work the land and you keep half and you turn over half to the person who owns that land or something like that, or wage labor. 22 March 1622, very important date. Powhatan Indians under their chief, Opacan Canal, mount in relative terms the strongest effort ever made to halt Anglo-American occupation on Indian lands. On that day, one-third of the colonists of Virginia are wiped out in one day. <laughs> Within the next year, another third would die. Wow. Of the survivors, two-thirds were not fit for work. The, the ruling elite said you couldn't even go out more than a few feet beyond the confines of the fort to grow corn, which was what they ate, the main crop, because you, you, there was no protection, you know, and they, they were fearful for attack. So what does the ruling elite do in this situation? Is what Naomi Klein calls um, shock doctrine, right? You've got a yeah, vulnerable yeah. population. Yeah. They impose new status, new labor categories. And they do it primarily on European American, on English laboring people. Here's the attack. At, for the elite, after 1622, the laboring classes were totally dependent on the bourgeoisie who controlled the supplies of food and stuff like that. They were compelled to submit to the conditions dictated by the bourgeoisie, the status of bond laborers. Chattel bond laborers starts developing after 1622. Chattel, your property. Right. You can be bought and sold. Right. You're bonded to somebody. They are not signing indentures. Right? You asked about that. Oh. And when they write about this, just like they don't mention a hundred and some odd years later, they don't want to mention slavery in the Constitution and stuff, they call it the custom of the country. That's how they code this shit, you know, <laughs> when they, the chattelization. The custom wow. of the country. By the spring of 1622, you see new things appearing in the law. People can be bought and sold, right? Heirs. Heirs and assigned. You can be assigned to somebody else, right? So chattel bond servitude, what they develop after 1622, one, it's a qualitative break from England. This is why it's not feudalism or anything like this. Break from the statute of artifices, because that says you're, you're free and you get paid wages. It's a break from that. It's not a feudal carryover. Under feudalism, there's a two-way bondage. There's responsibilities both ways. Here, you can be sold, but you've got no say over it, right? It's imposed as custom of the country. It's not apprenticeship. This is a new relation of production, a new status. Here are the numbers. Please pay attention. You asked, somebody asked about this. Between 1607 and 1682, of the 92,000 European American immigrants brought to Virginia and Maryland, mostly to Virginia, over three quarters were chattel bond laborers. And I can assure you they weren't signing indentures in England because that's not a status they have in England. Some, some did, but the great majority did not, as Alan points out. Uh, in 1676, the year of Bacon's Rebellion, the governor estimates 1,500 European chattel bond laborers arriving yearly. Such re recruitment was generally coercive. Few were wholehearted volunteers, right? And ha where are they getting these laborers from? Some were kidnapped, right. some were convicts. Prisoners taken rebellion, and the conditions were very bad in England, right? So people mm -hmm. facing great poverty, too. There's a host of situations going on. But Alan goes into this in great detail, so you can probe more deeply any questions you have, right? Um, in this period of chattel bond labor, this is very important, there's a denial of family life. Marriage status was incompatible. Mm -hmm. If you're going to be working four or five or six years as a chattel bondster, they don't want you to have children. That's time off from work, right? So 
all kinds of normal family life or for, fornication becomes a crime, right? Yeah, no, you, it, uh, so the employing class outlawed sexual and family life amongst limited term bond laborers. Oh fornication, reason to rebel. <laughs> right. for, fornication and adultery were punishable by fine, whipping, or two to three months imprisonment. Jesus. Women were exposed to special oppression, right? And you'll see this, and Alan pays particular attention to this throughout, and when he's dealing with capitalism in England also. And the wife's servitude should be twice the time for which she was bound, made a crime for a minister to perform marriage on a bond labor. Law made children of such marriages illegitimate, right? 17th century, 17th century to 1600s, African Americans and Europeans. Allen makes this point, as does Lerone Bennett Jr. in the book that I mentioned. Lives of African American and European American laborers and chattel bond servants, servants were very similar up through Bacon's Rebellion, at which time three quarters of the chattel bond servants were European. They, the conditions were bad. It was no Garden of Eden, right? They, the conditions were bad, but European Americans and African Americans did what normal people would do under those conditions. They fought together, they ran away together, they made love together, they functioned together, right? Life expectancy of bond servants was low. Most of the plantations were, servants were limited term bond servants. Three, four, five, six, seven. When they could get away with imposing water, the, the ruling elite would do it, right? The status of African Americans in the 17th century, most people don't know this. We're fed, you know, Kunta Kinte getting off the boat, you know, to a full-blown system in roots, right? right? But it wasn't like that. This is 100 years, 150 years before then. 17th century, African Americans in Virginia, if they owned property, and some did, right, could exercise marriage rights, exhibited social mobility, some had significant land holding, some were owners of European bond laborers, they exhibited many forms of resistance. Most people don't know this history, right? The status of African Americans, Alan argues, was indeterminate because it was still being struggled out. It, it wasn't. It wasn't. Everything wasn't set up in place in this period, mm -hmm. and the issue of slavery versus freedom was being fought out. The very important case for the black family, family life, male supremacy, white supremacy, is the Elizabeth Key case. Elizabeth was the child of a European American father and an African American mother. She was scheduled to complete her term of uh, servitude when the estate to which she was bonded sought to impose lifetime servitude. Her parents had died. She was supposed to be ending her servitude, her short, limited term servitude. And the people who had claim to her, her labor were trying to extend it, right? She, yeah, that's a rendition of her. She does, back then, African Americans could go to court. She goes to court, right? You're not gonna be able to do this a century later. And she argues on two grounds. She argues because she had been baptized. There was some precedent for this. If you were baptized, you couldn't be uh, you know, sentenced to sl servitude, slavery. And she argues that common law principle in England, in England, they bring the laws of England here to the colonies. The law, the common law is partis sequitur patrum. Forgive my Latin, right? The status of the child follows that of the father. Her father's English. She should be free, right? <laughs> she prevails. She wins, wow. right? Within six years, they say, wait a minute, the, the, they, the <laughs> ruling elite. <laughs> yeah. This is where the conscious decision making comes in. No, that's not the direction we want to move, right? <laughs> and they change it. And they change it to partis sequitur ventrum. The status of the child follows the status of the mother. Which means, as, as child bondage, and particularly as ra racial slavery develops, than all the children of the enslaved women who may be taken advantage of, but whether they're taken advantage of by overseers or others, right, become enslaved, right? This is the direction they want to move. This is crucial. This is a qualitative change. When I grow up and I'm going to college, there's a book by a fellow named Herbert Gutman on the black family and slavery and freedom. Oh, everybody thinks Gutman, he's a great historian, blah, blah. He starts the book in 1790. You gotta go back to this. This is a qualitative change. We have to look at and analyze and understand that. So what Allen's arguing is in this period, pre-Bacon's Rebellion, the white race did not exist. The plantation bourgeoisie was pressing for extended servitude, for more prescriptions on free Amer Americans. But he's also arguing, and this is important, the invention of the white race at the beginning of the 18th century can in no part be ascribed to demands by European American laboring people for privileges vis-a-vis -vis African. That's not what was happening.
They weren't saying, we want privileges over these. They were fighting together. They were yeah, in yeah. similar circumstances. Okay. The Dutch controlled much of the trade in Africa, in labor in this period, because they, they were very prominent on the seas. But within less than 40 years after the founding of the Royal African Company, the English would become preeminent. The number of bond laborers was increasing. Between 1671 and, um, uh, in 1671 there were 8,000 of uh, 15,000 tithables people taxed in Virginia were bond laborers, 6,000 European, 2,000 African Americans. Between 1680 and 70, after Bacon's Rebellion, 30,000 30, European Americans came, 24,000 were bond laborers. You had, in a roughly a similar period, 1674 to 79, 6,000 African bond laborers. So they're still dependent on European bond laborers, right? People, again, don't know this history. Here's Bacon's Rebellion. I went through some of that earlier. I'm not going to belabor that. Um, so in the wake of Bacon's Rebellion, the ruling elite had a serious social control problem. They, the rebels had risen up, they had kicked the governor out, they controlled <laughs> the land, and there was no ready remedy in sight. So they turned to a new system of social control, um, which was the invention of the white race. And Allen describes how this is done. A new social status was to be contrived, white identity, not designed not only to set European American laborers and bond laborers at a distance from the end, not only to divide, but at the same time to enlist the European American of every class as supporters of the capitalist agricultural system uh, based on chattel bond labor. So they were supporters of the system, right? And how is this done? He goes through the codification of laws, right? Uh, and the introduction, uh, introduction of this counterfeit of social... They're not being promoted out of their class, right? But they're being given privileges. Privileges which were rights in England become race privileges in Virginia. Presumption of liberty, right to get married, right to carry a gun, right to read and write, right? The, these are some of the ones. And he goes through the laws that get passed in all these. But they do more. It's not simply that they give privileges to um, uh, European Americans and that they extend the servitude of a uh, of significant sector of the African population, but the laws start going after the free African Americans. And this is what really makes it racial oppression, right? Because it's across the board, all African Americans are so, so denied free African Americans to right to hold office, barring any Negro from bearing witness. Remember, Elizabeth King could go to court, right? right. Making any free Negro subject to 30 lashes for lifting his hand. When they start taking away the right of self-defense of Africans and African Americans, mm -hmm. that opens the door for so many things, particularly in terms of attacks on the family, attacks on African American women, things like this. So he goes through all of these, right? They do more, and this is gets this to me. I think we have to drive this home in light of what's happening today for people. We could talk about this. They propagandize, propagandize the people in white supremacy. They got to teach them what it means to be white, right? So they start, and the way they do it is they tack the laws and they tack the rules on the church doors and the courthouse doors. They got to teach these people what it means, right? Just and today we have people telling people you're white. <laughs> I mean, think about this. Yeah. Um, 1723, Act to Fix a Perpetual Brand. This is key, Alan pays particular attention. Passed an act, no free Negro, free Negro, mulatto, or Indian whatsoever shall have any vote in the election. African Americans, if they own property, have been voting for 80 years in Virginia, right? They take this away from them. Governor Gooch of Virginia has to explain this back home to England, because even in England they don't understand. They say, well, if these, if these people own property, why can't they vote, right? So Gooch has got to break it down to him how we do things here. He goes, to fix a perpetual brand upon free Negroes and mulattoes. That's his words. Fix a perpetual brand. Alan writes, surely that was no unthinking decision. That's a response to Winthrop Jordan, right? You know? Rather, it was a deliberate act by the plantation bourgeoisie, meant repealing an electoral principle that had existed in Virginia for more than a century. The Act of 1723 also inc included denial of the right to self-defense, and that opens the door for all those attacks on black family, black women. Why the exclusion of free African Americans? You might ask, well, why would they go after the free African Americans? This is very important. This was the real reason. There was a marked tendency to promote a pride of race among white people. The exclusion of free African Americans from the intermediate stratum was a corollary of establishment of the white race. 
they're not promoting them out of their class, so they're selling them this thing. Well, you're different than that. You know, you got this, this privilege, and they don't, right? And um, the invention of the white race is rights and privileges. That's just what I've been going through. But what Alan's pointing out is that so many of these things that were rights in England are now racial privileges in England. And this is important. I want to just mention this argument. In Virginia, mean, right? in Virginia. Right. yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I'm getting how long we've gone away. Okay. And I want to point this out because Morgan, who I mentioned before, besides his argument about too few free poor to matter, and I don't know if I have it here. Let me see. Uh, yeah, here it is. Okay. Morgan's American paradox. This is a second Morgan argument that Alan takes on. Morgan goes fa further in, in one of his articles and in his book. And to Alan, what Morgan argues is the following that democracy and equality, as represented in the Declaration of Independence, this is later on, and the Constitution were made possible by racial oppression, right? Or as Morgan stated it, the slavery of Afro-Americans made possible indeed was essential for the emergence of the notion of equality as the fundamental constitutional principle of the U.S. This is probably a dominant theme in U.S. history. This is the president of the organization of U.S. We've all heard it. Yeah, but what Morgan is really saying is, you know, we've got these great democratic liberties. He calls it a paradox. But he's saying these liberties, but unfortunately, if you will, they were built on slavery. Allen stands Morgan on his head. And he goes, if you go back to Bacon's Rebellion, when those European Americans and African Americans are fighting side by side, if you were to come and try and say, well, we're going to enslave this, you, this sector and not that, it would have been like pouring kerosene on the Jamestown fire. They would have been all over you, right? He goes, rather than, rather than uh, the uh, slavery being the basis for the democratic liberties, you have to understand that in this country, it was extending liberties as racial privileges that made possible the system of racial slavery. Very different. It takes it right on its head, I think. So <laughs> racism made a positive. That's Morgan's thing, and Alan's arguing differently. Alan also uses arguments from historians Jackson Turner Maine and Audrey Land to show that the laboring class Europeans in the 1700s were not being promoted out of their class. Finishing up the last couple of slides, yes. Oh, I just wanted to Yeah, add. last couple of slides, two or three slides. White race was invented as a social control formation. A distinguishing characteristic was the participation of the European American laboring classes. In time, what they developed in Virginia would be expand, extended throughout the other plantation colonies. Uh, in his last years, Allen suggests taping, taking up four basic challenges. Here they are. Show that white supremacy, this is for people doing work today, show that white supremacism is not an inherited attribute. Demonstrate that white supremacism has not served the interest of the laboring classes. Third, account for prevalence of white supremacism within the ranks of the laboring class. And fourth, show ways whereby European American laboring people may cast off the incubus of white identity. The incubus is a devil. As we move forward, this is, I think, the last four slides, I suggest we keep in mind insights from Allen and Harrison, learn the lessons of the three previous crises. When I first met Allen, the first time I met him, in 1969, he was giving a talk at a place called um, the, uh, Alternate U. And he was giving a talk, and he made this argument about the three crises and the ruling class turning to white supremacy in each, each period. That stuck with me. And if that is true, which I think it is, I mean, I think he makes the argument, we have to learn the lesson of history, right? That's number one. Number two, I think his five-stage cycle is instructive, and particularly how there's the overtures we saw in Occupy, we saw in Madison. You know, people starting to wake up, they're starting to come together. They're going to come and they're going to try and break it with the white supremacy. Um, crucial, let's see. Uh, let me go. Remember the insights from Hubert Harrison? The Negro is the touchstone. Every issue we look at, let's look at it. We know, we know capitalism shaping it, ruling class. How is white supremacy shaping it? How are we going to deal with it? How are we going to address it? And in closing, remember Allen's insights. White race was created and maintained as a ruling class social control formation, principal historic guarantor of ruling class domination. White supremacy reinforced amongst European Americans has been the retardant of class consciousness. Efforts at, at radical social change should understand and affect and reflect the centrality of struggle against white supremacy. I think that's the end.
Yes. I got uh, many questions. I'm going to keep it to two. One is, would you like a, a, a bottle of water or anything like that? Uh, oh, I got my coffee. You're okay. Uh, yeah, to yeah. Your voice I, I need the coffee. I, was, I almost uh, fell asleep. Well, oh, I'll be asking a lot. Maybe that was a more substantial, a less important question. Besides taking care of your voice. Uh, and that is, you know, I wanted to know, ask if you could conquer. I mean, first, thanks for that. Sure. It's awesome. You really did get into a lot of depth. But I want to kind of oh, yeah. see, you know, and there's a lot of interesting historical questions that I hope we can get into, and I have, you know, that others uh, open discussion and maybe after. Uh, but I wanted to ask you a kind of more, I guess, a political or strategic mm -hmm. question, and also kind of move us into the contemporary moment, Good. which is to say, uh, I wondered if you could concretize maybe two two things very related. How so? What do you see as the actual form in which kind of appeals to white supremacism? You know, uh, or the offer of white skin privileges is, is taking in our present crisis, right? I mean, you, you know, like what is the ways in which, you know, potential insurgency is being headed off, or the ruling, you know, the, the social control formation of white supremacy supremacy is being mobilized today? And because I guess my sense of it, I guess the subtext would be, it's not necessarily explicitly white, right? Or it's not necessarily say like, be white, right? So I wonder what are the what are the codes and the ways that you see in our current moment, or even in re more recent history, even like from the 70s to today, you see the white supremacism being mobilized. And then the flip side of the question would be, what does it mean concretely uh, to repudiate white supremacy or white skin privileges? You, you mentioned at one point that it's yeah. not enough to just like yeah, say, you know, uh, yeah. I'm not white, you know, even though that's, that's like, a good like you know, yeah. and, and I guess the, the subtext of that one, I'd also like to hear you speak to how so. Allen's understanding of white skin privilege and the need to repudiate it in the in the way of repudiating it is different from you know say uh, the repudiation that is implicit or explicit in say Peggy McIntosh's theory of white skin privilege. I don't even know that she uses repudiation. She right. I think she says let's face it. Well, what is it? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess, I guess I'm basically yeah. asking oh, the question oh. of practice, yeah. both in terms of like what the yeah. ruling class practice is now right. and what should be our practice, and and how you know and this maybe gets a little bit into the what did you call them, the, the artful dodges right. and this sort of thing, and how to how to think about this practically. I mean, you talked about maybe the post office is one concrete context. Right. I wonder, I mean, there may be others, but yeah. that, that's my main question. All right. Mm. I'll, I'd like to go through them, keep them, we'll, we'll start with this right here. Yeah. Keep them in mind. I'm going to start going, and when I don't get to one or two of them, just remind me, and we'll go. Okay. Let me start from the post office. Um, okay. because, uh, because I worked, I come out of a 4,000 worker facility in Jersey City. And we did very good work um, for many years there um, at all, all levels in our union good. amongst working people. And Jersey City is polarized. Jersey City, they own a little bit like Boston, I think, right? You know, and, and we're, we're not the only city. Jersey City, <laughs> Boston, you know, all over the country. Yeah. And um, so we were dealing with that context. And at a certain point, when we got control of our local, our branch of the union at this big 4,000 worker facility, we started addressing issues, and rather than a single spark can start a prairie fire, which was what one of the contending groups was using, we decided to take a very systematic approach. Oh. We would come out with our newsletter every week on Thursday. Why? Because every other week on Thursday was payday, right? And people, we knew we had the most people in the joint that day, right? <laughs> No, I mean, this is real. No, right? that's true. And, and we would do it. Every, we'd come out, there's no loss of issues. As I indicate in the developing conjuncture, every issue you look at, we got, we're, we're against the bosses, but they, it's all shaped in a white supremacist fashion. So in the post office, we look at discipline. Black worker, white worker, same offense, double the discipline. Same thing you got outside in sight. It's not hard finding issues. Everything you look at, right? Uh, we had women. We had, you're supposed to get... Um, if, if you're pregnant, you're supposed to get light duty in the mm -hmm. postal service. That's part mm -hmm. of the contractual agreement. Right. But they started denying, and in, in my craft, mail handlers, heavy duty work, oh, yeah. the women were primarily African American women. They start denying them their light duty assignments. So we're protesting. Jesus. We're at the congressman's office. We, at, every issue we would look at, we wind up coordinating statewide anti apartheid. We bring it beyond the confines of the place. We, and and in. By doing this on a regular basis, on a regular basis, um, another thing, and this gets more more direct to repudiation and what you're talking about, in a in a pay location, in a work area. Say you got 16 people working in a work area, and it's going to be two hours overtime. People want that overtime money, you know, because the wages are never enough. But right. they, they're given the OT, 
boss's favorites, you know, and it's a very racist yeah. pattern, right? Yes, that, that's yes. easily detected in there. So we get our people in the pay locations to come together. We're not standing for this anymore. You're going to keep doing that? Gee, that truck's not getting out tonight. You know? <laughs> no, I mean, that's yeah. what goes on. Totally and you can yeah. do it. And when you do that, of course, you stand up. Some people stand to lose their overtime to equalize it, but this is the step that working people have to take. You know, you've got to show that solidarity. Alan argues using the old wobbly slogan of an injury to one is an injury to all, solidarity forever means privileges never. Don't, you, you don't accept those privileges, you challenge them, right? And we would do this in the, in the post office. And for instance, um, when the anti-apartheid stuff came, and this was a workplace that initially was only 15, 20% maybe black and Latin, because um, I, I, that's part of the postal reorganization, just like they did with the um, with the um, what I talked about after World War, after the Depression, uh, they did the same with the Postal Service. They turned to a whiter workforce after the postal strike in 1970. They built all these bulk mail centers and moved them outside the inner cities. Right. So at first, our workplace wasn't wasn't so heavily black and Latin, um, but we had in this place, which was racially polarized, and some people who had just never had any kind of friendly relations. You know, some European American never any friendly relations. African Americans or anything, we had three quarters, maybe 75, 80 percent of the people wearing anti-apartheid buttons for the first time in their life. Wow. I'm very convinced, you know, if you're fighting a good fight and you're clear and you break this stuff down and you explain, people will fight the good fight, you know. But Alan, when he writes in, in these articles, he talks about the arguments that people, all the arguments that come up, or the basic argument, oh, it can't work, you know, what does repudiation mean? We, workers know what it means to stand together. We went out on strike. You go out on strike, you risk losing that job. You got to stay together. You know, you've got. To, it, and why? Because it's in our interest. That's why people go out on strike. You don't go out on a humbug. You, you, you do an illegitimate thing. Now, when Alan turns to some more of your questions, so when Alan's writing, and I had some of these in some of the slides, he's talking about big issues oftentimes rather than microaggressions. I'm, you know, I'm not belittling microaggressions, but he's talking about people coming together, mass actions, collective actions, right? So the two to one unemployment ratio, I think we should be all over that, every place in this country, right? The, the incarceration stuff, right? And pe people oh, yeah. jump all over that. Housing. I, I think one of the things you have to do is you have to come to know each other a little bit and stuff like this. When you're in these segregated communities and things like this, the, every issue we look at we can be fighting over and we have to try and build that. Now, one thing that I think Alan's work suggests, which I don't think is being done, is my impression. Uh, and if it is, I think to build the movement we need, we have to get people coming together who understand and put in practice the centrality of the struggle against white supremacy. That's like, it's not like the program of some organizations. I know I have friends in these organizations, right? Where you look at their program or their platform and number eight is, oh yeah, we're against racism. You know, it's not like that, right? Central, this is it. And only by taking that approach and putting into practice can we build, I think, the organization we need. That, that, that's some more of what I would think. In terms of repudiation, it's a constant challenge. You know, you've got to just day in, day out, you know, what, what, address, what issues are we addressing? What's my practice? You know, and you, you try and do it. And, and for Alan, you know, it's a, I think it's a struggle. You know, it's a struggle every day. How do you, how do you move in this direction? Yeah. yeah. So just to offer a sure. synthesis of what I heard you say, that sure. the emphasis I heard you say was that it wasn't persistent, like, target and get, you know, uh, white privilege, you know, get people to give up their white privilege. The, the emphasis of what you, your answer was that, that there should be a conscious, deliberate effort among, you know, so-called otherwise, you know, white, whatever, European as well, all yeah. workers, to stand in solidarity with those who are experiencing the extreme attacks at the, at the you know, under un, under this white supremacist system. So right. The solidarity with the those who are being attacked but, at the bottom is like the main emphasis. Well, that, the that, other thing follows that, that, that. That's a very important emphasis, right. but there are going to be situations where European Americans are getting very concrete privileges, right. which they got to stand and say, no, we're not playing this anymore. We right. want fair. I gave the example of overtime. Another one, and I used this in the article which we published, right? Mm -hmm. Richard B. Moore, whose picture I showed here, who was a friend of Harrison, back in the 1930s, the Communist Party waged a campaign uh, for jobs on 125th Street in Harlem. 
And, and Moore points out early, he goes, well, if you wage that struggle, because black people weren't getting those jobs, right? Yeah. A lot of uh, store owners, right, and they're giving them to people of their ethnicity or whatever. He goes, Moore points out that if you're going to wage this struggle, some white workers are going to lose their jobs, right? Mm -hmm. That's what's going to happen, because that's how they're going to respond. You've got to be prepared to deal with that. He was accused of a nationalist deviation and basically <laughs> expelled from the party, right? And then later, Abner Berry, the fellow who chaired the committee, a few years later said, yeah, no, more, more was right. You've got to be ready to deal with this. You've got to deal. Just like workers, if you're going to go strike, if you're going to do job actions, you know, you might lose your job. I mean, we've got to have that consciousness. It, it, we, we can't sell false illusions. That could, I mean, it's a struggle, right? Right. Yeah. And, 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 and so we've got to do that. We've got to be prepared. But that's why we have to be developing an analysis of what our class interest, you know, where, where, where are we going with this? Just like, one more example, and I'll get right with it. Civil rights work struggles down south. You're going to go march on those picket lines or something like that. They're barking dogs. They're, you're, you're, you're up against it, right? You, you've got to be ready to face this stuff, and some people are going to get hurt, you know? Oh, yeah. But people do it because the, it's a higher cause. We've got to push for and we've got to build that. But one way I think we do build that, amongst others, you know, you put it in practice every day, you know, workplace, blah, blah. But I think part of it is the analysis of what this white race thing is, why it was set up, how it was set up, whose interest it serves, that there's nothing progressive in this. Not white worker, worker, right? You know, the, the, I mean, that notion, we've got to move in that. Yeah. That's what I think. Um, we'll go you, you, you. Yeah. You know, my experience, I guess, in more recent years, uh, you know, I hear the term white privilege, and it seems like that's the point of departure of a discussion. And it seems to me, to a large degree, the question of institutionalized racism uh, sort of gets on the back burner there. Uh, the, uh, the term people of color, okay, 40 years ago, you know, uh, a young black woman, I was a young black man, she said, you know, hold out your hand. She said, you know, we both have color. You know, I don't want to be called a colored person. Okay, today, people of color. I, I really don't see much of a difference, okay, in terminology between what I was, uh, you know, what was being fought against 40 years ago and, 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 and what I see today. Uh, now, I could be wrong, I, I may be wrong, but it seems to me that throwing this into the lexicon is uh, more a it's an indication, a reflection of the defeats that have been suffered by uh, the press nationalities in this country, uh, more than anything. Throwing what into the... We have to go back to a lexicon of people of color. Uh, I just think, in my experience anyway, that the that putting to the fore the discussion of institutionalized racism uh, and making, putting that more in the center of the discussion as opposed to white privilege, uh, I think would go a longer way to, to combating this, uh, this system that, that exists uh, of, of racism, you know, this, this racist system, essentially. Uh, so I thought I'd just throw that out there. That, you know, I tend to agree with you know, in affirmative action. You know, this was an incredible advance in the, in the class struggle in this country. This was a victory of enormous significance that, you know, seems to have been down. Now recently, in recent years, I really don't hear much of a fight or a discussion or a debate or a struggle around the need for affirmative action. Uh, you know, which I, I mean, I saw it in the factories that I worked in. They had to hire black people, and guess what? That meant the whole workforce was was uplifted in, in these plants I worked in because there was a new, you know, the communists, you know, uh, had to be given a fair shake because there was affirmative action. We didn't get fired as easily, mm -hmm. arbitrarily. This kind of stuff. They couldn't get away with it, you know. Anyway, those are my thoughts. The, the discussion of white privilege, or putting that on the front burner as sort of the topic of discussion, 
as opposed to a discussion of institutionalized racism in today's context, you know, I, I think is sort of a retreat. All right, one, just a couple of, um, the notion of institutionalized racism, I, I, I know some organizations use that. Um, I, I think that um, takes out, if you will, the element that this is being done for a purpose. In other words, that's just like it just happens. It's institutionalized and it just happens. Uh, and I think we don't want to lose sight of the fact that what's going on serves ruling class interests. They're behind it. I mean, to this day, they're shaping all these policies. And this may get a little more. I, I mean, some of the issues, the gerrymandering issues, all of this stuff, yeah. what they're doing, they're taking away the voter rights, right? I mean, these are some of the issues. and. They are ones where black people are being attacked, but that's also working people. That's working people who are being attacked, too. So that's a working class issue, too. That, um, so, and... and um, that makes sense. Yeah. And I, I think, I just, as I've said here today, I mean, I think Alan's right in his analysis of how this gets developed, how it gets maintained. And I think we, European Americans, if you will, right, have to challenge this. We have to educate, you know. And, and, but it's not, you know, just calling people names and stuff like that. Because I, I, I work like you did, right? You're in there. You're trying to win people and educate them to things. So, you, you know, it's a constant and it's patient. But I think, I think Alan's work, when it gets digested, gives us a little ammunition for going after what's going on, why it's going on. And what's doing? And again, I see Alan says there's nothing positive in white identity. For a working person, I certainly, you know, I, I that's I certainly agree with that. Um, regarding the people of color and some of the language and stuff like this, uh, Noel Ignatiev. I don't know if you're going to have him here and stuff. But I invited he, him. Yeah, yeah, but, but yeah. yeah, but <laughs> th there are, um, you know, I mean, he argues, and it seems this goes on. I mean, there's a lot of people make a lot of money of this, um, you know, white privilege, <laughs> he calls it the white pri you know, the undoing racism industry or something like that. They get all yeah. kinds of non-profit grants and funding and stuff like this. Yeah. But that's not, a, from what I've seen, I, I'll stand corrected, it's not like it's a class approach, it's not like it's looking to address broad social issues and things like that. And that's what Alan, when you read in his pamphlets from the 60s and 70s, he's talking about affirmative action, the anti-war, you know, the issues where we want to intervene, housing, you know, fair housing. Um, we want to look at these broader issues where we're mobilizing people and get, and educating. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, sure. I just had a few points to sure. bring up. First of all, thank you again for the talk. And this event was recorded, and I know that Jeff went through some of the slides quickly, so hopefully the focus was good enough that you can just pause and watch it there, which will be available on the Center for Marxist Education Facebook page, um, hopefully tomorrow. Um, secondly, unfor well, fortunately, the CME has no corporate sponsors, so we do need to pay our rent. And if you also, I'm going to pass the bucket. And if you also want to get on the email list, I'm going to pass that around as well. So, John. Can and my my main question was, um, you you brought up a few other scholars or activist scholars, however you want to call them, on on this issue, and I was just curious, um, since you actually just brought up Nola Ignatian or Ignatiev, like, what would we say some of the differences, if any, methodologically between his approach and Alan's, and also, you also talked that Alan wrote an extended critique of David Rodiger's Wages of yeah. Whiteness, I was just wondering if you could maybe give us a brief synopsis of that. Yeah, well, yeah. briefly, very briefly, Rodiger, um, if you read his Wages of Whiteness, the original one, and you read Alan's critique, which I recommend you do, um, Alan argues that Rodiger kind of disparages Marxism in that early one. He turns to, um, he defers to Jordan in his analysis that he argues that the working class develops in the 1820s as opposed to what Alan and Harrison and Du Bois and all these people are saying, you know, about labor. And that it grows out of labor competition. Now, one of the arguments Alan makes in his book, in volume one, I didn't get into this today, but in the case of the Irish, when they, um, when they do their sea change. Um, one of the arguments that was being made was the labor competition argument. But as Alan points out, the competition was more intense with German immigrants and stuff like that. There were only 10,000 blacks in New York, right? 
And so the labor competition wasn't what was causing it, it was the white supremacist shaping of all this, and that, right? So Allen makes a number of arguments like that with Rodiger, and, um, and of course, Rodiger, even the whole thing about the whiteness, and he tries to attribute it to Du Bois, if you read, and Allen makes this point in the argument, if you read Du Bois, it's, um, it's the public and um, psychological wages of whiteness, public, and then he lists what they are, and these are all, in society, white skin privileges, what Alan's talking about. So Alan Wright, show me how this is not white skin privileges, what you're talking about, you know? That, that's some of the things with Alan and Rodiger. Um, and there's more, but I, sure. I, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Um, labor competition, you know, key. And in the Developing Conjuncture article, I get into a number of them, right? So you'll find them. With Ignatiev, Alan and Ignatiev do very important work in the early period. They come out of POC together and things like that. There are some differences in the early period. My impression, having gone through a lot of the primary documents, is, and I wrote to Noel to clarify this a little, I had the impression that Ted was the main theoretical impetus behind a lot of the work. Noel was a little more, you know, wants to get it out into the public and, you know, raise these issues and stuff like that. That's one thing. Uh, one major difference, I think, is um, later on when Noel writes um, uh, uh, how the Irish became white. Uh, his is a little more, I believe, it's been a long time since I've read it, you know, it's springing up from within a little bit through white worker agency or whatever. Yes. And Alan is arguing, as I showed you here at Tammany Hall, the, yeah. the, the ruling elite thing. Um, so Alan was not, he, he was not enthused about Ignatiev's book, right? Oh, you. you know, I, I can elaborate on that more later. And um, then there were other differences when Ignatiev moves. It, it, Alan, I, I, in some of the correspondence I've seen, it looks like, I, I, I believe it's Alan who writes about, you know, he, he, Ignatiev puts that race trader, but Alan starts making the argument abolition of the white race, and then later Ignatiev starts, I believe later, starts talking about uh, new abolitionism and things like that. Because Alan said when you edit a journal called Race Trader, you, uh, I think Alan's argument, as I recall, I, I didn't come sure. here fresh with this, was that's limiting it to European Americans, essentially, right? Whereas if you call this the, the uh, you know, abolish the white race or the new, uh, you know, abolition, that's all encompassing where we can all play a, a role in that fight, you know? Um, other things along those lines, um, uh, Ignatiev at one point gets into a whole debate with, uh, I think, a Klansman and stuff like that. Alan didn't think he, you know, that was the way to be going, you know, a number of things. But, but overall, um, there's much commonality, you know, in their work. I mean, there's differences over the years, and um, I like much of Ignatiev's work. But Alan, I think, um, really did a lot of the theoretical, historical analysis. And I, if I didn't make this clear, part of my goals Besides, we got the Allen out, and I'm finishing volume two of Harrison and another collection of Harrison's writings, and then the goal is to put all 700 of Harrison's writings and all of Allen's on mine for free, if we can, you know, uh, permanently. So I'm talking with, you know, I'm working with Columbia possibly to put Harrison's, but also maybe these other places, right, that we can. And I want to do the same with Allen's, because I think we want to get this material to current and future generations. I, 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 as I've said in what I write, I think Harrison and Allen are two of the most important thinkers on race and class in the 20th century. And because they're, when they're writing, they're functioning outside institutions. You know, that's one of the reasons we don't know more about them. But I just encourage people to really read them. Because one thing I found with Allen, I see it in Harrison too, but with Allen, even people who throw his name around haven't really read him. You know, and I encourage people to do that, right? Really read them because he's deep, he addresses these issues. It's not an easy, it's not a quick read. That's why I did this internal study guide. But I really encourage people to read them. Uh, I, I can cite example after, even blurbs I have up on my webpage from people, and I can read the blurbs, and I know they didn't read them, you know? And uh, I want to encourage people to read them. He, he's important, however I say that. I hope some people get that message. Maybe we should do a reading group here on it. Anyway. <laughs> yes, Jeff. Um, I, I wanted to comment on something and also ask a question, but I guess I just want you to clarify 
uh, I guess, like, what, uh, you know, uh, Alan means by uh, white privilege, and especially in a, another uh, context, such as Brazil, uh, where my family is from. You mentioned how mulattoes, for instance, were used, you know, like, had rights to land, had their own slaves, etc. Um, and in Brazil, it was the same thing. Brazil was actually the last country to abolish slavery, and it was actually the country that had the most slaves out of any country. Um, but yet, nonetheless, there are like still uh, a lot of, I, I can make a lot of comparisons between Brazil and the United States. I actually just came back from there. Um, you see things like police brutality, the people live in the favelas, which are, you know, poorest areas of Brazil, are predominantly, you know, black and mulatto. Um, and a lot of things that, you know, I hear in the United States, like the fact that, you know, a black person in Brazil can't walk around without being stopped, you know, by the police. Um, so, you know, there is like a sort of like universality, uh, you know, to uh, racial oppression, it seems, you know. Uh, but what I wanted to say about uh, white privilege, I think it also ties to what he was saying about organizing, you know, the working class and actually building solidarity. Um, and I know there are people who don't necessarily do this, but I think for the most part when leftists are talking about white privilege, it's a way of actually, if anything, raising awareness to uh, you know comrades of different races uh, to the things that they don't that they're not necessarily able to see because of their pri privilege as a white person. So the fact that they're not necessarily used to the same job discrimination as a Latino person would have simply because you know their like last name does have like the tilde or something like that. You know because their last name isn't Nunez, they're not going to be uh, discriminated against. So things like that, you know, uh, and building solidarity with people of color. Uh, using white privilege is a way of actually, you know, like, uh, bridging that gap and actually being able to build solidarity. You can't organize with people who don't necessarily, uh, you know, understand uh, what struggles they're going through. Um, but, yeah, uh, I guess that's it. I had more to say, but I completely All forgot right, just, it. <laughs> just a couple of responses. In terms of Alan's writing, um, he, only, he speaks briefly uh, in volume two in the beginning about Latin America, including Brazil, very briefly, right? Some of the differences in terms of how, um, what the Europeans encountered and who, which Europeans were coming. And, and he does that to make the point about how England was unique because it's exporting all these laborers. He does one whole chapter in volume two on the comparison between uh, Anglo-America, Virginia, and Maryland, and the Anglo-Caribbean. That, that is very instructive. But beyond that, he doesn't go more. But he also encourages, always, to, for people to examine their own the, the historical particulars, you know, each one. Not, he's not looking for, you know, a blanket formula for every place he's, he's trying to analyze here. That's one thing. In terms of the privileges, uh, a lot of the ones that he's pointing to and addressing are things like, again, the, the, the very systematic ones, the privileges, employment policy, hiring, promotion, discipline, um, housing, health care, you know, I mean, again, all these issues I think we could be getting all over. Now, another thing I think that you were raising, Joe, maybe in the beginning, but uh, another area, um, what's going on is in the public discourse, right? All of this association, there's so much association, if something's public, <coughs> associated with black people and white people, li like health care, for instance, right? You can't even, you know, oftentimes broach single payer or anything like this, you know? Um, because they try and drill that into people's minds, you know, in various ways, on the TV and media and stuff like this, um, for a lot of public services that we should be encouraging and developing. Um, you know, war, I mean, Alan talked about in, in terms of the anti-war movement, you know, role of white supremacy in that, and how the, the white supremacy, you know, Vietnam War, he was writing about particularly in that time, we could look at the Mideast or wherever, right, and what's going on in the white supremacist aspects of that, too, and bring that component in, into it. So that there would be the point that sometimes the, the white supremacist shaping is kind of coded in a way, so like, so like, it's not necessarily saying white, black, but like right. public services or welfare, right, oh, it's very racialized much. Yeah. Way. So white, so people are encouraged to disidentify Good. with welfare yeah. recipients or something like that. And it, yeah. that's an effect affirming a kind of white identity. Right. Even if they're not saying I'm white, they're saying I'm a good, hard working American yeah. as opposed Cold to a slacker. Yeah. Code right? words, and totally. That's a lot of the way, I mean, that's kind of what that's I was Yeah, good, thing. good. And if I didn't hit that enough before, yeah. and let me give an example. I just want to give another example. I, I gave the ones about the Depression. The postal strike in 1970, 
conditions were so bad for Paul. I started in 74, but I'm familiar with 70, and we went through strike. I went through a mini strike in 74, a big one in 78. We had a few hundred workers get fired pre-PATCO. We got fired under oh, Carter. Yeah. Everybody yeah. talks about uh, who was Reagan. Yeah. <laughs> Reagan with the PATCO. We got fired under Carter, the Democrat, right? Um, but um, in 1970, and the, the miners. Yeah, the postal workers rise up, particularly in New York and Chicago, where the workforce is 70, 75 percent black and Latin. And I, this is in wow. my article too. And they they rise up. And it starts out very independently, then some of the union leaders hop on board, they don't want to be outdone, right? But in the wake of that strike, back then, Wall Street ran on paper. Wall Street yeah. couldn't get their paper. The National Guard, the, you know, they couldn't sort mail. Um, and Nixon's the president and he catches hell. Business Week does 28-page article and Nixon, you know, getting castigated all over, right? So they pass a Postal Reorganization Act and here's what it does. It does certain things. One is it sets up a board of governors bet between the president, you know, and uh, the rest of us, right? So if anything goes wrong in the post office, he can blame the board of governors, he or she, you know, can blame the board of governors. Number two, they, um, they recognize certain unions. The American Postal Workers, which is not only an industrial union, the letter carriers, the rural letter carriers, and my union, the mail handlers. But the mail handlers were taken over by laborers international unions, one of the four big mob controlled unions in the country. So they willingly let organized crime come into the postal unions, you know, just to keep a, a hold on that. And they do not recognize a group called the National Alliance of Postal and Federal Employees, which was set up in 1913 when Woodrow Wilson segregates federal sectors and workplaces and stuff like that. They don't recognize them. But the la another major thing they did, and this is where my, coming out of my own experience, is they turn to a hubs and spokes system like the airlines have. They build 21 bulk mail centers, right? And each one is named after an inner city, but it's outside the inner city. So instead of the 60, 70 percent you got in Chicago or New York, black and Latin workforce, whatever, 80, 75 percent, you get the one, I'm in Jersey City, we're only 10 miles from Harlem, 10 miles from Bed-Stuy, 10 miles from Newark, but public transportation is atrocious. They set up tours in the middle of the night, and they start out with only a 15% workforce. The one for Chicago is in Cicero or Cairo, where the Klan marches, right? And you read, when they're passing this legislation and making this decision, exactly what you're talking about. It's the code words. When they, the, 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 the Congress people, they're saying, well, we've got to go back to the old style workers we used to have. You know, this is code work. Everybody knows what they're oh, yeah. talking about, right? And it's a turn, a conscious turn to a wider workforce, right? And they do that. So, but these are the type of things, you know, if we follow Harrison, the Negro is a touchdown. You keep those antennas up, every issue, it's there, you know? I mean, in this country, it seems to me, every issue, we got to look at it, we got to expose it, we got to educate people around it, we got to fight around it, you know? So I think, yeah. I was uh, just going to yeah. add, that, that was uh, the point that I was getting to as well, is the role that white privilege has in actually like reproducing, you know, the sort of like uh, ideology, you know, it's for instance the fact that when uh, workers, uh, you know, who actually like subscribe to this, uh, you know, like white supremacist ideology, they don't understand how you know, uh, the arguments provided like by the ruling class against, say, welfare and things like that uh, are actually, you know, against their interests. But an even more recent example is terrorism and, you know, like the NSA. I just uh, want to say one thing on what you're saying, when, when you say the, the white supremacists don't have, I think when you're talking about against their interests, I think it's important to emphasize against the workers' interests, yeah, absolutely. right? Because That's the ruling saying. class, it's in their interests, right? And right. too often, I don't mean to interrupt, because I want to hear the rest of what you got, but even groups, progressive groups, these nonprofits that do all the research, they'll break it into black, white, you know, all these categories. You've right. got to break it down by class, too, because you've got to argue, because otherwise it all gets, you know, buried in this shit, you know. Yeah. And, and that's what we, and we've got to push that, and we've yeah. got to put that out there and make that, I'm sorry. I, I, it just seems like the yeah. issue with white privilege comes from, uh, I guess the fact that people don't necessarily understand like the paradoxical nature of it, the fact that it simultaneously oppresses white people because they're working against their own interests, but they are simultaneously benefiting from it in you know the like limited uh, well, context we're discussing. Right, right. I want to talk more about that too. I mean, just this so-called benefiting. If we're talking working people, I'm going to give another example. 
this GI Bill. Yeah. I was talking with Charles about this earlier today. My family, I'm born in the Bronx, working people as far back, you know, you know, nobody ever goes to college or anything like that. Right. We move on the GI Bill from the Bronx to Paramus, New Jersey. It's got shopping malls, maybe you've heard of it, right? Yeah. All these shopping malls. It's essentially a lily white town, right? It wasn't, at the start of the century it wasn't, but by the time in the mid 50s it is. And people come here and it goes from 5,000 to 25,000 on a GI Bill. Wow. People, these working families think they're doing well. Well, I can get into what it's like growing up there and lots of problems and issues and things like that. But they converted celery farms and other farms. This is Jersey, right? All with toxic stuff all over. I went to my 50th reunion last week. 20% of the classes died. They ran the list, so many of them from cancer. My mom dies at 44. My father's a pipe worker, died, uh, asbestos worker, dies at 54 from asbestosis. They're telling you you're getting it good and stuff like that. I'm not convinced it's so beneficial, right, for people. Um, and, and living in that environment, you know, I, I've lived other places where I much prefer than living there, right, you know. So, but that's a lot of educational work, too, you know, that we've got to do. But I, I think we want to challenge that these notions that this stuff is beneficial. Because as I started when I spoke, you go to Wik uh, Wikipedia, the first sentence, and I tried to correct it. I tried to get them to say, well, why don't you say some people who hold white privilege theory say that all white people benefit? Because I'm quoting Allen, right, who pioneers this stuff. Uh, it's like it's it's like what happens when you try and raise stuff on Israel. You know, they ba they bash <laughs> you all over. They got the industry coming at you. You know, and and, and we've got to challenge that. I think. You know, it, I don't. I'm I feel very confident. The, these privileges, I think, are a poison bait. I mean, we. The U.S., and this is what we did in the article, in the article, you, you look at all these issues. Healthcare is a prime one. We're the richest country in the world, yep. and we're 37th or 47th in healthcare, you know? Yeah. We, we, we should be having much better. We should be pushing, and we could have much better if we weren't weakened by this stuff. So I don't think, you know, I don't think it's necessarily people think, I mean, not, not that the aristocracy of labor, if you will, you know, something like that doesn't, you know. Maybe it's it's called white skin poison. <laughs> well, that's what Alan like, called it poison bait, you know, like, like a shot of heroin. It looks good, yeah. you know, but it, it's... Exactly. I'm saying that I think most people who use the term white privilege actually recognize, you know, the, like the, I guess, uh, sort of, uh, you know, the various implications that it has, the fact that it does oppress white people, but it is a sort of relative privilege, because if we're talking about white people and black people or Latinos, they're, they're privileged relative uh, again, to other people. Again, if I may, yeah. you're, you're using white people, right? Yeah. And I want to encourage you, for working people, it, it's not in their interest. Mm -hmm. For the ruling elite white people, you know, the, yeah, and <laughs> it I is in their interest. That. I'm yeah. just saying, why do we have a difficulty actually talking about this concept? It seems like a lot of the time when you mention white privilege, it's like white people not really wanting to discuss you know, uh, <laughs> they don't understand it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't want to drag you. I want to hear other voices. But yeah, I'm sorry. This is an important issue. That's yeah. why it's. Yeah, no, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, think, I appreciate it. I mean, it sounds like even you were talking about Alan versus other folks, Macintosh, but even Ignatiev, that there, there's a tendency for the ruling class to retreat from the analysis to, 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 to kind of uh, fade. So, like, the, there's no sense that there is, like, the class antagonism, this fundamental class antagonism tends to get. Elided in some of the in some of the privileged talk, when oh. it gets to be about white and black and, and oh no yes, so I, I yeah I think and, and that's why I throw up in the in the beginning you know the the quote about the ideas it's in so many ways these ruling yeah. class ideas the ideas that serve their interests are out there so much of this discourse doesn't really get at it I don't think you know um, sorry you think it does though and I think you're right so. wait wait you think what well. No, uh, just seem to think that it, it hasn't retreated as much as. Like, wait, maybe I'm not understanding that. John, I mean, I think a few comments have, have okay. touched on this theme, and it just seems like it seems like Nunez feels like from his experience. I don't, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but that the people who are using the white privileged discourse, even if they're not coming out of Allen, are still aware of the the class dynamic and the. Well, you know, but the but what he was saying, uh, I was saying that poison bait right. it actually summarizes uh, the paradoxical nature of white privilege. Because you're saying that at the same time it's something that attracts people, but at the same time it is a right. poison because it does affect them. But that's what I think most people understand white privilege as. 
I'm saying, well, how do we actually improve the discussion so that when, like, what term could we use or whatever so that when we actually want to discuss this issue of the poison bait, white privilege seems to be, uh, I guess, just, I don't know, it's not the most productive term. Well, but well here's what I'm agree. trying to say to that. Here's what I'm trying to say to that. You, you keep, as you're describing this, I'm, I think I'm hearing him. You're saying white people, white people. It's a poison bait for the European-American laborers, not for the bourgeoisie, which are part of white people, right? So if you say white people, the, the, you're losing that class nature of what, who it's a poison bait for, right? It's a poison bait for the laboring people. For the ruling people, yeah, take the poison bait, you know? I mean, it's in their interest. So I don't think I'm encouraging everyone here, when you start talking about these white privileges, talk, talk about the European-American workers, or you know, however you're going to call them. For the workers, it's not in their interest. But what Alan's arguing throughout is for the white ruling elite, it's 100% in their interest. This is how they maintain control for all this time. This is how they make their profit. So I think just speaking about white people, that's not, you know, that's not the way to deal with that. You've got to break it down a little. That's what yeah, I'm, not, I'm not saying that. Uh, uh, and I'll stop, John. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I guess when I'm saying white people, I'm just simply saying that like, they're the ones that have the most resistance to this concept of white privilege, even though they should have, you know, if anything, interest in it, but, yeah. <laughs> One more time. What, what I'm saying is the, the, the working people, the yeah. working white people should have interest. The ruling class, you know, they're, they're, all right. This is a, one other issue. So yeah. I think we have to introduce here, which is that yeah. there are strata within the United States the, the people who aren't thoroughly proletarianized, right, but who also aren't the ruling class. So you have this kind of, I mean, the, the lack of a better term, the, the middle class, people who are, who I think, and I think there's an element of material, material privilege, I don't know what to call it, privilege or complicity, or, you know, there are people who have interests or have been given, I mean, how do we treat the middle class, I, I guess, that's a, that's a bigger question I won't ask you to go into now. I'll let other people. Yeah, I'm sorry. One fact. I'm sorry. A white working oh, class. Yeah, okay. there, there should have been a chair. Yeah. Right. Because people have been talking for a long time. I'm sorry. Uh, 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 back and forth. Uh, I put my hand up very early. I've been really quiet. And a serious meeting should have a chair. And it should have a, a limit on how long people should talk. And it should, uh, I, I'm sorry, I have to be strong on this. And uh, if they want to talk again, they should be allowed to talk again on a second round. Okay, uh, because, you know, I've been know sitting here and I don't have much time now. And I have three things to ask. And now i got to just ask something very, um, I think that's going to um, be uh, kind of uh, surprising to people. I've been at Amtrak for 35 years. I've held... Uh, uh, every single job in my union and uh, 14 years ago we had a major battle for affirmative action the only successful battle for affirmative action that I'm aware of maybe in three decades and I'm not kidding uh, we won we won uh, with a uh, majority white, because we had so few blacks in what I call the White Job Trust, from uh, New York to Boston. It was a White Job Trust, Southie, Seven Hill, all these places, and all the way back. And uh, uh, so um, those of us who were Marxists, I was in a group at that, uh, well, I'm in, still in the group, uh, got together and decided to initiate uh, with some of the black uh, uh, local presidents uh, a uh, broad committee for uh, affirmative action. But not, just, but not just for equal hiring, for um, 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 I'm sorry, I'm trying to think of a word, but... Um, quotas? Quotas, thank you. We demanded quotas. And we had a little fight on that. I bet. We had a little fight on that. Because some of the white workers said, well, you know, take it easy. Just let's try to bring people in easy. You know, and so forth and so on. 
can't you know. But we won them over. We won them over. You know. I mean, we only had eight workers out of 35 in the thing that were that were black. Now, if you know railroad, it's very. It really doesn't have a lot of uh, people in it. It's you know, and uh, so we were really a very big committee. We had uh, huge um, articles uh, in the front page of the Phoenix. We were in the Globe. We were in the, everything. We were going to bring Jesse Jackson to town before they before Amtrak collapsed. We were ready to have a, a big rally in the Boston Arena. Now I, I'm just gonna, I'm asking a question. We won. Uh, one of the most wonderful things was uh, when we started to feel our roads. Uh, I was the chairman, chairperson of the thing. Uh, instead of um, them trying to call, call me upstairs to the superintendent, uh, uh, suddenly he started to send his little men downstairs. And they said, they said, well, the superintendent would like to talk to you. I said, why don't you tell them to come down here and buy me a cup of coffee? <laughs> because you start to get the adrenaline, you know. You know you're, you know you're winning, you know. And so he comes down, and he, and he, and this, you know, a lot went on. I'm not going to go through it all. And he said, what do you want? I said, I want everything. <laughs> he says, well, 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 you know, I mean, it's normal to um, uh, uh, negotiate these things. I said, no. No, 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 no. Not where I'm coming from, it's not normal. Because that's the old labor movement. You walked in, you said, these are our demands, otherwise we walk. You fire a person, we walk out. You know what I mean? And uh, he says, I said, so listen, I just want to tell you what's, what's being planned. I have um, a person from um, 60 Minutes, uh, Jesse Jackson's coming to town, and he said, well, 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 take it easy, take it easy, you know what I mean? But, but an interesting thing happened. Um, we were able to get Amtrak to sign on uh, to um, uh, um, a commitment, and they kept it, to hire 50% uh, uh, um, um, from the neighborhoods, the oppressed neighborhoods, uh, you know what I mean? Uh, women, Asians, uh, you know. And, um, but as time went on, the uh, company got very smart. And what they did was they found ways to dismiss all the lower level uh, supervisors. I didn't see this come. Now because of the, because uh, the oppressed nationalities, what I call them, the oppressed nationalities have, have no reason to trust racist white unions in general. Um, all workers, all people look towards power. When they feel powerless, they go towards other power. It's like when the middle upper middle class goes. They'll, they'll go with the working class if the working class shows power, you know. And what happened was, um, cleverly, um, they hired uh, five new, um, well-trained well uh, supervisors who immediately would bring these young people in and say, you got to understand something. The union is full of nothing but Irish white racists. They showed no interest in you before. They never said that the committee existed and that it was overwhelmingly white. But it created an incredible division whereby uh, the black workers were just drawn to the bosses and they wouldn't come to union meetings. Mm -hmm. You know, even those of us that they knew had gotten these you know, got in this struggle. Do you know what I mean? And um, and then then things start to happen where um, not all, not all, especially the black women, because they had real, the black women had a lot of responsibility. The Latin women, you know, you know, 
Uh, but a lot of the young males, you know, they, uh, they wouldn't show up for the jobs, they wouldn't call in right, they'd break the rules, and then they just say, well, uh, there's nothing you can do to me because I'm protected. And this, cre this has created a terrible division in Amtrak again. I brought this up to Tim Weiss, you know, and I said, Tim, can you give me an idea about what, uh, any ideas you might, might have? You know, and I'm bringing it up to this body, you know, because this is a real, real problem. I mean, when you don't, when a train has to go out legally, and be safe. If it doesn't have a full crew, people can die. You know what I mean? And when somebody just says, well, I'm covered by these certain rules that I helped to get on, uh, um, there are a lot of blacks that are very angry about it, but um, it's just created this this terrible division and I, I'll just throw out I, I, I don't honestly I don't know what to do I, I will just offer a few quick thoughts I mean thank you thank you <laughs> first I mean talk you know talk to your co-workers I mean you, you can I do that tell yeah. me but I mean you maybe, brought this on yourself well, well I, I'm talking about maybe <laughs> maybe maybe get together a group you know over over lunch over call I mean you know, start talking on a regular basis Another thing, I don't know if you do this or not, but I told you when we worked in the post office, we'd come out with our bulletins. I, 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 what we found was frequency and regularity, right? Every Thursday, people knew it. After a while, they came to look for it, for giving some direction and guidance. And if you have a, a newsletter, whatever, if paid is every two weeks or whatever it is, whenever you get paid, if, if you even can come out with that, one side of a paper, two sides, however you do it, you can start addressing some of these issues in a in a very you know this issue has come up. What do people think? You know, it could be. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but open, engage. These are your coworkers. You know, and discuss with them and stuff like this. But you're obviously concerned about it. You think it's a it's an important issue that people should be concerned. Well, about. it's it's just been such right. a terrible but, white but, job trust for so right, many decades. We, so you, you got to have that discussion. Yeah. With your coworkers, right? You know, yeah. and 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 the commu communication. But just in response to that, do we have more questions, Jeff? And we, yeah, and are we good to, on your, what you were I, saying? I, I I actually understand what you're saying now. Um, oh, okay. you're, you're essentially saying that working white people don't necessarily benefit from. Yes. Oh, we got that. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. It's like a yeah. all eternity. That wasn't necessarily my question, though. I, <laughs> I was actually responding to what you were saying about the, the problem with this term white privilege. Because it is the commonly used term. My question is more, why don't working white people, uh, why aren't they willing to discuss white privilege? Right. Well, well, I mean, there's not many people out there ra raising it amongst them. A lot of the, the white privilege discourse, it seems to me, is carried on in universities and some yeah. of these circles and, you know, yeah. people working in these agency you know that's that's where the industry is if you will um what what my conscious decision and i know this was originally work people did in the 60s and 70s this series i mean i was a working class person right youth right came up and i got to go to college and after i go to college it's a conscious decision to go into the workplace 33 years right because that's where i think we've got to do work right and so why don't they well, maybe there's not enough people doing work there amongst them, you know, and uh, that, that, that's what's got to be done, you know. I, I, if you people are serious, which I think people here are, you know, you're serious about change, you've got to address what the issues are. I think there's some things pointed out. I, I, oh, think, yeah. I think the three crises is crucial. If Alan's right about that, let's learn that lesson. If white supremacy is so central, let's keep our antennas up, every issue, right? It's not hard to find. Um, if the working class, if we believe the working class, it's not in their interest, the working class has got to be a pr uh, primary force for change, let's get amongst them, you know? I mean, it's things like that. Uh, some thoughts. Yeah, yes, I'm sorry. No, right here. In the back. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I agree very much with what you say about that we have to address the race issue under the umbrella of the class. And, and that, in the, that, those terms, we are going to be able to see that actually white privilege doesn't benefit the working whites, the working class, at all. 
uh, we can see an example. Even the bargaining in the United States have uh, changed because we don't, in the labor movement, we don't want to help uh, legalize uh, undocumented workers. And they have been used uh, as low wage workers, even within the United States. We can even see that in Switzerland. Like people vote against raising the minimum wage of $22 an hour because you know, still the way a uh, working class believe that they can uh, have social mobility. Mm -hmm. Even though a lot of people coming from Europe, I mean from Africa and in, in Latin America has changed the bargaining uh, rules on, on uh, those countries in Europe. But I'm also interested in what, uh, what you have to say about the census. Um, yes. Because I worked in the 2010 census. Right. I came from New York to complete the uh, Spanish uh, interviews yeah. of the phone letters that were not <coughs> filled out by people. And then I was encouraged to uh, identify as white, even though <laughs> I am a descendant of a uh, Spanish Jewish, and the mother uh, indigenous, and I grew up in the black family. Uh, so, <laughs> so I don't see myself as white. Right. But then when I'm going to the field, I see on Lord Chester that many other people, uh, Portuguese uh, and Latin American descendants, they want to identify themselves as white, yes. and they have indigenous uh, you know, features. Mm -hmm. Because they uh, somehow they will feel that they were you not know, going to get any, something right. out of this uh, new communication. Yeah, I, I want to speak about that. We were talking about that earlier with Mirna, uh, who's from Venezuela, and her daughter, and uh, some of us were talking before. And um, what's going on with this census, I think, is very important. This is another issue I think we all should pay attention to, because what they're trying to do with the Hispanic category, yeah. mm -hmm. the Hispanic category alone is allowed to identify their race. One of the major reasons behind this, in Alan's article, it's online, it's, it's 15 years old now, but it's very good. One of the major reasons why they're doing this is because they want to maintain a white majority, or at least a plurality, as far into the future as they can, so they have the guise of democracy in what they're doing. Now, what's going on in with the census, as I said, from 2000 to 2010, the percentage of uh, Hispanic, the category that they're using, went up 3%. It's going up even more, and they even changed the wording to encourage people more to identify as race. Uh, there is all this pressure in this country, for the reasons you were just talking about, for people to say, gee, I want to be white, I don't want to be black. You know, that's, what, that's the pressure, that's what they're counting on, right? But I think, I think that Latinos are well positioned to take a very prominent role in challenging this white identity. One, one of the points that Alan makes about Hubert Harrison, that Winston James makes, and one of the people I cite in my book, is because these early Afro-Caribbeans are coming, I'm, I'm coming back to your question, they're coming mm -hmm. from a place where the white race, it's not the same definition, they're coming, mm -hmm. they, when they come to the U.S., when Harrison comes, he's the father of Harlem, he says, I'm not playing this shit. You know, this shit. He, he challenges it. Garvey challenges it. McKay, they come from where they're coming from and they can't confront this. They say, we're, we're not going to take this, right? And they challenge. Latinos are in the same position, right? Where, where you're in a position to challenge. And I think one, I think one of the ways, I, I'm not trying to dictate. I mean, I think people need this discussion amongst themselves, right? But a, a lot of people, they, you know, you, first off, if somebody's Afro, Venezuelan or whatever. It's important to identify that, you know, because of discrimination. But I don't think you want to encourage people to identify as white. Why, why not, you know, I'm Venezuelan, I'm Puerto Rican, what, you know, whatever. And, and that's my identity, and I don't have to go to that white thing. But I think it's got to be educated. I know there's the pressure to do it, but I think people who see clearly, who come here and see and know what they know from back home, too, it's not the same. You do, no matter how it is, it's not the same as here, can lead amongst you know, people challenging. Now, one other thing I want to talk about. If you can remember my name, I've got an article up on Black Agenda Report, Black Commentator mm -hmm. Counterpunch on the Lautenberg Amendment. The Lautenberg Amendment. This is, pertains to immigration. Very important. The Lautenberg Amendment was passed in 1989, and it's been re-upped every year since. 
and it gives special status to certain groups. If you're a member of that group, you can come to Kennedy Airport in New York without a paper in your pocket, you can be a felon in your home country, you're treated as a, quote, refugee, and you are given all pass to citizenship, public funding, and everything. Whereas all these people from Latin America coming up, the youth coming up, illegal immigrant, it rolls off the tongue. Everybody's called illegal immigrant. And, and the young kid in Harlem gets busted with two ounces of pot, and they're denied public housing for the rest of their life, however it works. It's totally discriminatory treatment. The Lautenberg Amendment. You got to read because what I think should be done with the Lautenberg Amendment is you people got to expose the inconsistency or argue well if it's good for some we want it good for all right I'm you know wherever you're going to take that but it's very important to do that and Lautenberg did that. it gets up every year you know is that and for Cubans no 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 this is for Jews from the former Soviet Union yeah. that's who it's for. Right, and it's and it ties into everything that's going on in the Middle East and everything like that. Very important. That's the main group. There's other groups. Cambodian Christians, I think. You know, pick, pick some obscure group. They, it's always done like this. But Lautenberg was the head of a prominent Jewish organization before he was my set. You know, from uh, Jersey. You want to look at this because it gets re-upped every year. It gets re-upped every year, and much work could be done for those who are doing work around immigration in relation to this. And it got, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna comment what he said. I think it's very important, Jeff, yeah. and it's related to our conversation. Hispanic, particularly the new, uh, the wave of immigrants from Latin America. Depending on the country, they have more tendency to identify as white as opposed to the Russian phenotype. They can look like you and I, but they are white. Make sure they want to be identified as white. They are replicating ideologies, prevailing ideologies back home. So it's very tricky because when it came to social policies, Latinos and all of Latinos who need help from the federal government, they are getting rejected, like Jeff said. It's very tricky. The same happened with Brazil. Uh, that if uh, you are a lighter skin or what, you know, it's very dangerous. So I think it's like we should be an edu uh, education about that white is an identity. It has nothing to do with nationality. In regard to your question, your comments, I think that you are more into try to read the Americanization of Latin America. And it will give you an, an idea about Anglo imperialism the English imperialism, when the United States became an empire, when England passed empire to, uh, to the United States, how these policies after World War II were implemented in Latin America to whiten the Latin American society. So it, it had a relationship with racial um, uh, white privilege. Yeah. It, I don't know if anyone else has a question. Thing. Okay, you get these forms, you check off uh, black, white, Latina, whatever. I imagine people with white skin can check off black and get away with well, it. Well, if you're, if you're, only if you're, quote, Hispanic, you, uh, you, well, no, wait, oh, 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 it's a legal thing oh, now. you could, oh, you could, but if they, yeah, they could. could. Couldn't we encourage white people to check the black well, box? Well, this is the preliminary census. Okay. This is the preliminary census. I yeah. didn't check anything. Well, what I'm saying is, yeah. you know, that these, you get these forms, you check off one box. Yeah. I don't see. Well, I, I think you can legally get these, away. These are not the official. Yeah, I don't know. These are not the official census. I think this is the, the preliminary surveys they're doing. Then why? Well, whenever you get a preliminary survey or whatever, just check off no. the black box. You know, it happens you to know. me at Mount General, at Old Hospital, whenever I have to. You know, I never check I, um, uh, ethnicity, but immediately they check me as white. Mm -hmm. And even though you're a mass general, you know, at all of the hospital, even though I haven't checked, they make sure that they check me as white. Yeah. And even though if I complain I am not white, you know, they check me as white. 
humanity had its origins in Africa. So, you know, from that standpoint, I could check black. Anyway, the other question, not a question so much, is when uh, 40 years ago, a working class white person with white skin could go to college for free, could go to the universities, or many of them. And if, if it wasn't free, you know, let's say it was 500 bucks a year, you'd get a $500 scholarship uh, because your family didn't make a lot of money. Okay, so that's practically free. If you look today with the, uh, the offensive against affirmative action and so forth, the working class kid who's poor, who, who you know has light skin, okay, got to pay a hundred grand. You know, I mean, it, it's ridiculous. It, it, it's a clear example of how the pushback against the oppressed nationalities and, and the victories that have been won by the rulers has directly oppressed the entire working class, regardless of what race or nationality you want to talk about. It's just, it's totally different today, and I've seen this in my lifetime. That, uh, you know, when Johnson was, was promoting this war on poverty and, and welfare and so forth, he constantly brought in pictures of white, uh, pe white working class people in West Virginia and, and in Appalachia and so forth as benefiting from these social programs. And this was kind of a way he promoted it, all right? And then it got, the whole thing got turned around over the last four decades. But I, I think there's a, that's a direct example of how th this invention of race and, and the white privilege has uh, directly oppressed uh, the entire working class in this country because you can't go to school like you used to if you were poor. I, I think um, I mean, just to, I, I think the struggle was very heightened in the 60s as you're describing. You know, the struggle and there were some gain, significant gains being made as, as we talked earlier, you know, the, the uh, civil rights black liberation struggle was a catalyst for many movements. The movement has been set back. I mean, we, when Allen closes Volume 2 in 1997, he talks about how the current climate and how work, people dare not even oftentimes mention working class, you know, and it's, it, the class struggle is one side banging or something like that. But, he, but how he's, he's not giving up hope, you know, because we, we, can, we have the examples of what was accomplished in those previous struggles and, and the gains that were made then. But, they, I mean, we, we're all living. How weak is the left right now? You know, when when do we hear working class mentioned? I mean, we're here, we've mentioned it a few times here today, but you don't see it in the press or in the debates of the elect. You know, the people running for office and things like that. So we've got to build that movement. You know, which is what we're trying to do here. You know, um, yeah. I feel we've been going almost three hours. I'm sure there's more. Uh, there's always more uh, conversation. I have more things I'd like to raise, but I feel like maybe we should. And then people can talk uh, individually, and, and we can have you back. Which we can always be on the uh, so I, I more, hope we didn't. There's always more to do. Is, is that all right with people? Is, is, there, is, that, yeah. is that cool? Yeah. yeah. All right. So all right. Thank you. A round of applause. Yeah.